quickly they realized the bottom was set to fall out of their empire, and when the spigot of funds from Privatbank would dry up. Maybe it was after Ukraine heaved into revolution, upending the existing oligarchic network stripping the country. Maybe it was after the new Ukrainian government grew wary of Kolomoisky's rippling power base and what he could do with his militias. Or maybe, likely, it wasn't until Gontareva and her colleagues flipped open Privatbank's playbook, revealing the loan recycling schemes to the world. Because that exposure didn't just reveal Kolomoisky's machinations or his shell company networks. As Ukrainian and American authorities detailed in a series of staggering findings and investigations, the end stages of the loan recycling networks required Kolomoisky's bagmen to visit a series of overlooked markets across a range of obscure locales, right in the heart of the U.S. The role of the Optima team was, when boiled down, deceptively straightforward. Korf and Labor used the Optima family funds as one large pool of money, according to Justice Department officials. They transferred funds back and forth between the different shell company entities, both to launder the money and to try to make money. In conversations and interviews, Korf had claimed that he barely knew Kolomoisky, or that the oligarch was simply a successful businessman who was being harassed by the Ukrainian government. But as the DOJ revealed, the American had, in reality, remained in constant communication with the Ukrainian oligarch. Korf discussed those transfers with Kolomoisky, who approved the use of the money, wrote American officials. But it wasn't simply a matter of handling the illicit monies. Korf, along with labor, established a complex system of entities in order to facilitate the laundering of the misappropriated funds. That is, according to the investigators, they helped erect a lattice of shell companies to disguise the mixed, mingled, swished, swirled money even further. They especially enjoyed using shell companies located in, naturally, Delaware. One Delaware LLC in particular, Optima Ventures LLC, was the primary vehicle used to acquire property in the United States with misappropriated funds from Privat Bank. America's favorite financial secrecy haven, used once again to help crooked oligarchs drain a foreign country dry, laundering and injecting ill-gotten gains directly into the U.S., helping the American laundromat churn and swell that much more along the way. With these Delaware LLCs, these recycled loans, and an ever-expanding pool of Ukrainian depositors to scam, Kolomoisky spent prolifically in the U.S. For instance, one $12 million loan from Privat Bank, according to loan documents, was supposed to be for funding ongoing operations for steel production in Ukraine. In reality, it went directly to the purchase of one Cleveland Center, the chisel-shaped building carving Cleveland's downtown skyline. According to the DOJ, another $13 million loan was scattered across a number of shell company accounts some of which then redirected the laundered money to fund the Crown Plaza purchase, landing the Optima Group the second-largest hotel in the entire city. The same schemes allowed the Optima family to pick up the historic Huntington Building, Cleveland's claim to architectural fame. So, too, the Pinton Media Building, the half-million-square-foot heavyweight, as well as 55 Public Square, towering over Cleveland's main downtown square. All of those purchases linked directly to the Ponzi scheme spiraling out of Ukraine. They were hiding their money in plain sight, said Tom Cardamone, the head of global financial integrity. No one else is looking at Cleveland. Nearly everyone willing to speak about the Optima schemes agrees on one thing. The Optima family ran their downtown Cleveland investments into the ground, drove tenants away, and showed absolutely no interest in any of their claims of launching Cleveland toward a bright, prosperous future. If Cleveland had already been on a downswing before Shokut arrived, the Optima family only helped drive a stake through downtown Cleveland's remaining potential. Most of the properties have fallen into disrepair and suffer from high vacancy rates, the local press reported. They're pretty much doomed, one journalist covering the purchases said about the entire Optima portfolio. Or, as one local familiar with the Optima purchases told me, they pretty much ruined everything they touched. Take the Pinton Media Building, for instance. At one point, an arrow in Optima's quiver, the Optima team found it over 90% occupied when they arrived in 2010. Just a few years later, occupancy rates had plummeted by over a third, 
thanks, as a later lawsuit claimed, to Optima's mismanagement that resulted in high levels of vacancy. Unsurprisingly, the building's assessed value plummeted as well, shaving millions off the building's worth. Or look at the 55 public square investment. At nearly half a million square feet, standing as the former home to a range of white shoe law firms, the Optima team purchased the building in 2009 in order to cement Optima's downtown dynasty. Before Shokit swooped in, the building was seen, as one outlet called it, as a moneymaker, with an 85% occupancy rate. Fast forward a decade, and the once flourishing building is in dire need of a makeover, according to the Cleveland Plain Dealer. The alt-weekly Cleveland Scene described 55 Public Square as a situation of disrepair and vacancy, a hollowed-out husk in the middle of downtown. Few businesses, if any, remain. The John Q. Steakhouse space on the ground floor has been vacant for years, the Cleveland Scene noted. In 2018, the building received an appraised worth at just over half of Optima's purchase price. But even that bottomed-out price wasn't enough for inquiring buyers, with one development firm describing it as unworkable. As one local familiar with the purchase told me, Optima just ruined that asset. Or consider the Huntington Building, that staple of Cleveland's history, its murals and brass and lobby an architectural testament to the city's better times, stood as the keystone of Optima's portfolio in the city. At the time of purchase, the plain dealer noted, the Huntington was generating significant income, housing accounting firms like Ernst & Young. It was the soaring, gleaming evidence of Optima's arrival in the city. But a half-decade later, the building stood cavernously empty, with little more than sparrows' nests and abandoned desks, and with occupancy rates cratering to lower than 10%. According to the plain dealer, the building, the second largest office building in the world when it was constructed, is now little more than an aching, bracing emptiness, a gaping hole gouging downtown Cleveland. Around the same time the authorities in Kiev began probing Privatbank's finances, the Optima team began divesting itself of the Cleveland assets, selling some of the properties, the Huntington going for $22 million, the Pinton building going for $38 million, to new developers seeking reclamation projects. It's unclear what prompted the sell-off. Corf, Labor, and Shokit all either ignored or declined to answer my questions. But one theory has floated to the fore that would match up with other kleptocratic stories we've seen time and again when it comes to American real estate. For many of the kleptocrats and crooked officials eyeing America, real estate provides a gateway to any opportunity they need. Teodoran, for instance, saw American real estate as a means to his mogul-slash-celebrity lifestyle. Some, such as Iranian officials who secretly used American shell companies to snap up a Manhattan skyscraper, use American real estate to skirt sanctions. Others, such as corrupt Venezuelan officials looting the country's coffers, use it to escape an imploding economy back home. But we've also seen crooked officials and corrupt oligarchs eye American real estate for the same reason the rest of us turn to real estate investments. For a stable, swelling market, generally appreciating, presenting a safe, sturdy investment that can provide a bailout if your financial portfolio goes belly up. Think of American real estate as a kleptocratic rainy day fund, the greatest rainy day fund in the world, worth trillions and trillions of dollars. Which is exactly what it appears the Cleveland investments were. For a billionaire like Kolomoisky, it mattered little if the renovations that people like Shokit promised never came to pass, or if millions of dollars ended up knocked off the sale price because he'd let his downtown Cleveland purchases go to rot. The land would always retain its worth, even if the buildings didn't, even if they left gaping holes in a dying downtown, and if, as Kolomoisky may have anticipated, his Privat Bank Ponzi scheme ever collapsed, it's always good to have backup assets worth millions of dollars, isn't it? Those hoodwinked by Optima's claims now recognize what American officials have alleged, that the Optima family, with Kolomoisky as backer, had no designs on rescuing Cleveland, but were more interested in flipping the city into their own personal laundromat, all on behalf of a Ukrainian oligarch turned warlord. No one really knew, one local familiar with the purchases said. It took a few years before people really figured it out, but the writing was on the wall. Still, not everyone involved in hyping the Optima investments wants to discuss them, 
Mark Vogel, the investment banker who initially described Shokit's presence in the city as a coup and who had even attended Shokit's wedding, told me I couldn't quote any of his previous praise for Shokit, even though the quotes were published in Plain Dealer articles. Do not quote me, Vogel told me over the phone. I mean it. I've been really nice to you. Don't come at me and say you're going to quote me on something a long time ago. Don't fucking do that. I work for Warren Buffett, and I can fucking make your life miserable. Am I going to have to fucking ram up your ass? It's unclear what the last sentence meant, and Vogel did not respond to other questions about Shokit. But these schemes also pointed to a new chapter in the story of American kleptocracy. No longer were kleptocrats looking to megalopolises like New York or Miami for their laundering needs. Now, America's heartland appeared open for business, and America's overlooked interior was ripe for exploitation. It's bad enough that the dirty money from abroad has been flooding into Miami and New York, but it intuitively makes sense that criminals and the corrupt would want a Manhattan penthouse, said Clark Gascoigne, one of the U.S.'s leading counter-kleptocracy voices, as well as an Ohio native. But when it infiltrates cities in the heartland of America like Cleveland, it should be a wake-up call to all of us that we have a serious problem, and it can happen anywhere. And it did. Real estate purchases in Dallas linked directly to Kolomoisky's dirty money, including a local commercial real estate icon, sit undeveloped and vacant. A major $77 million purchase in downtown Louisville ended up in default, with one American bank arguing that Optima failed to make good on a multi-million dollar loan that came with the building's purchase. It was the same story Cleveland experienced. How many other cities looked at similar financial spin men as potential financial lifelines? And we've only touched on the commercial side. How many residential buildings faced the same fate? How many units within how many buildings served as little more than sinkholes for the dirty money Kolomoisky and other oligarchs and officials grabbed? What about houses or apartment complexes or empty lots, entire swaths of acreage, farmland or timberland or grazing land? How much of the American real estate industry's success rests on modern kleptocracy? Thanks to rampant anonymity and the ease with which these kleptocrats and crooked officials can spend their funds in the U.S., we don't know the answer to any of these questions. Nor do we know how many Americans watched their property taxes jump as these kleptocrats overpaid for these assets. Nor do we know how many areas sagged or emptied out, all because the kleptocrats showed no interest in ever turning their investments into profitable vehicles, desiccating entire neighborhoods, innervating entire chunks of American cities and towns and communities. We just don't know. But if there's a silver lining, it's that these are just buildings. For the real costs of this new chapter in the story of the American laundromat, you have to visit the steel valleys and the manufacturing plants targeted by the kleptocrats and their American handmaidens. Chapter 13 Fucking Cursed Our society had been a kleptocracy of the highest order, the government doing its best to steal from the Americans, the average man doing his best to steal from the government, the worst of us doing our best to steal from each other. Viet Tan Nguyen In 2010, a cooling panel at the Warren, Ohio steel plant began leaking. It wasn't the first time a leak had been spotted nearby. These panels, which were meant to monitor the temperature of the plant's furnace, had become constant sources of dripping, draining water escaping through unpatched holes and faulty tubes. The water leaked directly toward the churning, burning molten steel, a situation that could result in a fiery explosion if the water reached the metal. According to later court documents, workers spotted the leak before it reached the molten mass. They tried to get the attention of the furnace operator, who was then in the process of pouring the metal from the oven. But the furnace operator didn't see, or maybe couldn't hear, his co-workers. He missed the water threading its way toward the lava-like mass, and missed the last few moments before water met metal, before a burst of hot air blasted upward, outward, toward workers and brick walls alike. The explosion tore through furnace walls, sending bodies sprawling, and sending workers to the hospital, backs bent and bones busted, skin charred and melting off arms and legs. At least one injured worker needed back surgery and years of recovery. But that wouldn't be the plant's final convulsion. A year later, another blast battered more bricks, shattered more windows, scattered more bodies. I was like a ping-pong ball, one employee 
Michael Buckner later told the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, ICIJ. I got thrown down steps. You couldn't see anything. Even those employees who weren't injured nonetheless saw the consequences. The skin was literally peeling off Buckner's forearm, another employee said, of the injuries. It was horrible. Buckner added that reliving that blast, which severely burned a number of his other co-workers, is a never-ending nightmare. It never goes away. This second blast prompted a formal investigation from federal regulators tasked with keeping steel plants like the one in Warren safe. Their inspection at Kolomoisky's plant, though, turned up numerous concerning signs. Over a dozen troubling violations of basic safety protocols, things like water seeping from cooling panels, meeting molten metal, exploding like a grenade, greeted them. One of the dangers at the plant, one member of the Warren City Council told me, involved the inexplicable decision to replace worker safety glass with cheaper, shatter-prone glass that you could break with a hammer. Not that those still working at the plant were surprised. They just kept cutting corners, William Norman, who worked testing metal strengths, later said. They were running a skeleton crew. They would not hire more help. I would tell them they needed to hire more people, but they didn't want to hear it. The new management, ultimately overseen by Kolomoisky, apparently couldn't care less for workplace safety. It was night and day compared to previous management, Norman added. By 2014, the explosions and the bodies and the federal violations seemed to catch up with the plant. Citing challenging market conditions, management halted operations that March, pledging to reopen by early 2016 and promising to eventually double the workforce when it did. But months went by with no word. The plant continued to idle, as did about 200 steel workers reliant on the plant for their livelihoods. And then, in January 2016, the United Steelworkers Union, which represented the plant operators, or at least those who'd survived the repeated explosions, received a phone call. We were informed that the company would go from temporary idle to permanent idle, Pat Gallagher, one of the local union directors, said. Unforeseen business conditions had forced their hand, management claimed. Today, the Warren Steel Plant lies in ruins. Cavernous holes gouge the siding, with peeling yellow and blue paint giving way to swaths of rust and sloshes of mud. Vacant lots and missing windows, crumpled cabinets and offices in disarray, whether trashed by looters or former employees is unclear, round out the place. The mill sits like something out of a dystopic future, or like something out of certain parts of the former Soviet Union, for that matter. If you visit, you can still get a sense of what the mill once was. When you climb high up above a factory floor and stand next to a hook double the size of your entire body, it's something special. Cleveland photographer Johnny Jew, who specializes in photographing abandoned architecture, wrote after visiting the plant in 2017, where he took searing photos of the detritus and the damage remaining. But those hints of what the mill once was pale next to what it is now, a gutted, sickly, abandoned remnant of a time when America's heartland swaggered, before the walls caved in, before a post-Soviet oligarch and his team of American helpers came to town. I've explored numerous industrial facilities across the country, Jew wrote, but have never set foot inside something of such immense size and industrial grandeur left to rot. But there's one element missing in the story of this Warren plant. The Ohio plant's collapse can't be attributed just to an oligarch-turned-warlord or just to his American henchmen scurrying across the Midwest, gobbling up forgotten buildings, forgotten plants, forgotten towns. That's certainly what we saw play out in Cleveland, where empty, vacant husks stand as a testament to the Optima family's interests. The plant in Warren, though, brings another element of this new chapter of kleptocracy to bear an element that highlights how easily these kleptocratic networks have begun carving rust belt carcasses, feasting on what's left behind, stripping them bare and leaving them and their towns and their industries and their people to decompose. Because Kolomoisky wasn't the lone Ukrainian oligarch involved in overseeing the Warren plant. There was Gennady Bogolyubov, his longtime partner since the earliest days of Ukrainian independence. And there was a third figure involved a man named Vadim Shulman, whose path paralleled Kolomoisky's until the relationship between the two broke apart on the back of the American steel industry. Shulman is a stone-faced oligarch, 
a bit long in the ears, with a penchant for yachts and tennis. Like Kolomoisky, Shulman joined the procession of those funneling post-Soviet monies into American assets, using similar company networks to invest in American steel plants, including the benighted Warren plant, where he and Kolomoisky became business partners. But according to a series of lawsuits Shulman filed in the U.S., not all went according to plan. As Shulman claims, his relationship with Kolomoisky soon shattered, undercut by a move in Kolomoisky's loan recycling scheme that no one in Warren could have seen coming. In a number of legal filings, Shulman claimed that Kolomoisky, alongside the Optima family, secretly oversaw a long-running, self-dealing debt accumulation scheme to defraud both steelworkers and partners like himself. Specifically, in Warren, Kolomoisky oversaw a series of large-scale and coordinated fraudulent schemes, all of which swindled Shulman, lined Kolomoisky's pockets, and expedited the destruction of the Warren Mill and hundreds of American jobs with it. The schemes, per Shulman's filings, initially appear complex and convoluted, juggling shell companies and financial secrecy jurisdictions and all the wonderful offshoring toys those of the billionaire caste have grown to love. Boiled down, though, they transform the destruction of the Warren plant and the destitution left in its wake from a story of negligence into something far worse. When the partnership began, Kolomoisky, Shulman, and Bogolyabov all owned equal shares in the plant. But starting in the late 2000s, according to Shulman, Kolomoisky began secretly transferring ownership to a separate offshore entity. Shulman, whose lawyers didn't respond to interview requests, claims his signatures on the transfer documents were forged. From there, the Warren Mill transformed into a key cog in the broader loan recycling scheme itself. As Shulman's lawsuit lays out, Kolomoisky and his accountants began using the Warren Steel Mill as an entity to specifically provide those fraudulent loans that went to pay off the previous loans bouncing around his web of shell companies. On paper, Kolomoisky's team issued a number of loans that documents claimed would be dedicated to improving the Warren plant, say, improving safety protocols or preventing future bone-breaking explosions. But then, in the bogus loan carousel Kolomoisky and his team allegedly set up, the loans sped right through the Warren plant itself, reissued as loans the Warren plant was now providing to other Kolomoisky companies. From there, those loans re-entered the loan recycling circuit, joining the rest of the mixed, mingled, swished, swirled money eventually winding their way to destinations elsewhere. In the legalese Shulman included in one of his lawsuits, the loan proceeds passed straight through Warren Steel, then through a network of related parties, before finally being dispersed to other entities and or individuals which were owned and or controlled by defendants Kolomoisky and Bogolyubov. In effect, Kolomoisky and his crew hustled the loans directly through the Warren plant, making it seem like the Warren plant was the one then issuing the new loans, effectively turning it into their own miniature loan recycling outpost. Instead of springing for repairs, or new investments, or basic steps to protect employees, Shulman claims that Kolomoisky and his team left the plant itself holding the bag for, on paper, tens of millions of dollars of the recycled loans. All of this while never intending to actually follow through with any of the claims made to those in Warren, either to the furnace operators and union men reliant on the plant for work, or to the city officials reliant on the mill for the town's economic health. It's unclear why Kolomoisky used this Warren plant specifically, according to Shulman, as opposed to any number of the other American plants he owned. But the implication was clear. It wasn't shifting economic tides that forced Warren's closure and it wasn't tight-pocketed owners running low on funds. The mill was allegedly a sham purchase from the get-go, meant to obscure a money-laundering operation larger than anyone could have realized. If Shulman's allegations are to be believed, one analysis found, the official reasons for the closure, a faltering industry and lack of financing, look more like pat excuses, trading on the well-worn economic tropes of the region and obscuring more nefarious causes. As Shulman claimed, Instead of attempting to operate war and steel for a profit, defendants Kolomoisky and Bogolyubov exploited the business to enrich themselves, all to the detriment of war and steel and plaintiffs. Yet Warren wasn't the only American steel town obliterated. In West Virginia, 
a long-standing plant in New Haven, located in a small stitch along the border with Ohio, ran directly into the same issues. The decades-old ferroalloy plant, steered by one of the kolomoisky connected companies since 2006, has been battered by a series of lawsuits alleging malpractice when it came to worker safety. Workers interviewed by the Kiev Post revealed that injuries at the facility were common due to a lack of maintenance and management's refusal to supply them with equipment, citing cost concerns. One plant worker died in 2009, a 27-year-old employee persuaded to work 90 hours a week who fell asleep and crashed on his drive home. Safety sucks, upper management sucks, nothing good to say, nothing good to say, nothing good to say, one mistyped comment on a job review site read. In Kentucky, another steel plant, tucked near the borders with both Ohio and West Virginia, went belly up in 2018, costing another hundred plus jobs. This is nothing but bad and sad news, one local official said. As in Warren, the company claimed current business challenges forced the plant's closure. Nothing about Kolomoisky, or about Privatbank, or about the schemes and scams allegedly linked to the other American assets and American plants wrapped up in the Ukrainian oligarch's web of illicit money. It seems none of the American assets went untouched. Some shuddered, as in Ohio and Kentucky and Indiana. Some buckled under piling debts. At Michigan Seamless Tube and three other steel plants, the bills began to mount, ICIJ found. Niagara LaSalle in Indiana owed a trucker $17,191. Corey Steel in Illinois owed a brass supplier $105,000. Those earlier promises of job creation and bright futures collapsed all around the region. Under Kolomoisky's ownership, ICIJ calculated, hundreds of steel workers in Kentucky, New York State, and Ohio lost their jobs and in one case were left without insurance coverage or the ability to temporarily access their retirement funds, court records state. Jobs lost, plants destroyed, neither ever to return. The plight of one enormous factory showed just how much of a millstone these assets, caught in the Optima web, could become for an unsuspecting town. After Shokit visited Harvard, Illinois in 2008 to announce the Optima Network's purchase of the former Motorola plant for nearly $17 million, kindling hopes of finally seeing the plant fulfill its potential, he proceeded to ignore the town almost entirely. Keim wasn't around much, Charlie Eldridge, the head of the local economic development group, told me. I would see him once a year, once every other year. I saw him about as often as he came to Harvard. Clearly, it wasn't the focus of their interest. As Eldridge added, it quickly became clear that the Optima Network didn't really have any plans about what to do with the facility. By early 2014, the building not only stood vacant, but it now stood dark. With a half-million-dollar tab in unpaid electricity bills, the juice was cut off, forcing local officials to visit with flashlights. It's just heartbreaking to see that beautiful place sitting vacant, one said. Soon thereafter, the heat was also shut off even though the plumbing hadn't been fully emptied. Unpaid property taxes likewise kept accumulating, starving the strapped local government of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Along the way, the massive building itself, its factory and fitness center, its childcare rooms and 500-seat auditorium, even its pair of heliports, continued a slow march toward implosion. Weeds began poking through the parking lot. Mold began creeping along the walls, along the roof, into the pipes, into the recesses of the building. The factory's entire fire suppressant system, including over 20,000 sprinkler heads, began falling apart. Their replacement alone, according to one local official, will itself cost upward of $20 million. On and on and on, one by one by one, the building's issues continue to pile. The mechanical equipment all needs to be replaced, Mayor Michael Kelly told me. The roof leaks. No one's really taking care of it. Nor, as Kelly and Eldridge point out, is it just that the building's infrastructure continues to degrade. At some point in the none-too-distant future, the issues will cross an accumulated threshold. Like a car on its way to being totaled, the building, at some point, will have to be condemned rather than recovered. And that point is only a few years away. The building won't just be valueless. It will be a catastrophe for the town because it will have to be demolished, Eldridge told me. And the net cost for that, after salvage, 
is probably three to five times the city's annual budget. It will be a financial catastrophe. Eldridge paused, pondering that reality. That this hundred million dollar investment, this hundred million dollar promise to a small outpost town in northern Illinois, ended up with a crooked Ukrainian oligarch interested only in looting and larceny. An oligarch whose involvement now risks dragging the entire town down with it. I think there's certainly a good many citizens who feel it's better the building had never been built, Eldridge added. There is a twist to the Harvard story, though. Somehow, Kolomoisky's team found a buyer in 2016 willing to take on the former Motorola plant, infrastructure issues and all. The new buyer, just like the old, was an international syndicate, this one headed by a Chinese-Canadian businessman named Xiao Hua Gong. Gong, who prefers to go by Edward, claimed he wanted to transform the plant into a smartphone manufacturing base. According to Eldridge, Gong was initially very charming and full of conversation of what wonderful things he was going to do. Not too dissimilar from a certain Ukrainian network that parachuted into Harvard a few years prior, singing much the same tune. Only a year after the sale, though, officials in Canada dropped a bombshell. Canadian authorities accused Gong of running his own transnational money laundering scheme. Liaising with authorities in China and New Zealand, Canada lobbed multiple charges at Gong, including fraud and money laundering. Said Eldridge, by all appearances, he's a con man. All of which means one thing. The Harvard Motorola plant has apparently entered not one, but two kleptocratic pipelines, passed between two kleptocratic networks, tossed like a volleyball between a pair of foreign oligarchs, juggled while an American town sinks into oblivion. Following the charges against Gong, the Motorola plant remains frozen. Local authorities can't touch it, as it's part of ongoing investigations attempting to unwind Gong's network. And those in Harvard watch this factory, this initial promise, sit vacant rotting away, along with whatever potential it once held. It's almost as if these oligarchs, that they have so much money that the rules don't apply to them, they can do whatever they want, Kelly sighed to me. I think the community sees that the Motorola plant has been a huge albatross for us. He paused, took a breath. The building is fucking cursed. The reality of this Motorola plant points to yet another new chapter in the unfurling story of American kleptocracy. No longer are these networks out of Ukraine or China or Equatorial Guinea or any other nation, all eyeing the U.S. for their money laundering needs, simply isolated streams of dirty money. Now, assets like the Harvard plant can be traded, can be swapped, can be shared among multiple dirty money networks. The only reason we know anything about the Harvard plant is because American and Canadian authorities, aided by partners in places like Ukraine and New Zealand, opted to target the specific money laundering networks linked to Kolomoisky and Gong. But given the miles-wide availability of other American money laundering services, there's no reason to think the Harvard plant is the only nine-figure American asset bandied between parallel kleptocratic networks. If anything, it's the canary in the kleptocratic coal mine. Thankfully, some in Washington are finally seeing just how wide America's money laundering embrace truly is, and how much it's begun infecting the giant swaths of rural and small-town America that investigators had previously ignored. One of those tracing the contours of this new reality is Karen Greenaway, a former FBI agent who'd previously focused largely on money laundering concerns, especially out of Ukraine. In early 2019, Greenway sat in a hearing in Washington in front of the U.S. Helsinki Commission, there to discuss the methods of recovering and returning looted funds. Amidst discussions of Manhattan penthouses and anti-corruption squads in Southern California, Greenway turned the hearing's attention to the exact phenomenon Kolomoisky and Gong had highlighted. I'm not sure people do understand how damaging taking dirty money really is to the United States, Greenway started. I like to use the analogy of, if you've ever lived out in the far west, a dry stream bed. Dirty money is like a rainstorm coming into a dry stream bed. It comes very quickly, and a lot of it comes very fast. And the stream fills up, and then it gets dry again. The money races in, but there's no constant flow. So what if you're a company that's purchased by dirty money? 
that dirty money is not going to be a steady flow into and out of the account so that you can run the business the way it's supposed to. Just as Warren and Harvard and all those other towns learned, that flash flood of dirty money will wash through, but that stream bed will dry up just as quickly with adverse consequences for everyone outside the oligarchs or the kleptocrats' immediate circle. Greenaway continued, Because it's dirty money, and because you sunk $23 million or $48 million of it into the purchase of that property, now you got to go find some other money to pay all the bills that go with it. And so what does that do if that's now a business that has U.S. workers employed in it, and their operating incomes are constantly being drained so that the oligarch can pay for his next yacht bill, or whatever it might be? What happens is, of course, is that the safety standard goes down. But people don't want to say anything because they want that job, and they need that job, and they need that business in their community. And what you're going to find out is that after 2008, when the financial institutions collapsed essentially in the United States, was there was a fire sale for a lot of our properties. And as a result, what we have is people who don't live in the United States, who don't have any intention of really investing in the United States, but they needed a place to put their money. Now the money is drying up, and now those businesses are going into default, and maybe that's the only business in that community that's employing people. Not just maybe, at least when it comes to the American towns Kolomoisky and his bagmen picked apart. Towns like those in the Steel Valley, reliant on those decades-old steel plants for another generation of jobs that now will never come. Or in those pockets of the Midwest, reliant on the promise of a local factory that will now never function. Or even in places like Cleveland, which watched Kolomoisky and his men roll in and dominate an entire downtown and leave little more than smoke and detritus in their wake. I think it's hurting small-town America, Greenaway closed. I just don't think that we've come to that realization yet. Nor do we know how many other oligarchs, how many other warlords, how many other kleptocrats have sunk their teeth into steel towns into farming towns, into rural towns, into manufacturing plants, and oil hubs, and port cities. Thanks to things like anonymous American shell companies, and anonymous American real estate purchases, and other anonymous American financial secrecy tools, we have no idea how deep these oligarchic tendrils have burrowed into places we'd never expect. In Alaska and New Mexico, in North Dakota and North Carolina, in Kentucky and West Virginia and Ohio. Nor do we have any idea how many towns like Warren and Harvard have suffocated alongside, their livelihoods lost, their budgets strangled, their economic fortunes devastated. All because of this American kleptocracy. By the mid-2010s, the U.S. had rolled into a new chapter, both in terms of its politics and its anti-kleptocracy efforts that few could have seen coming. In the Senate, following nearly four decades of service, Carl Levin finally retired, bringing to a close a career that arguably did more than any other in Washington to highlight the spiraling threats of modern kleptocracy. The PSI continued on, diving into cybersecurity and the opioid crisis and healthcare fraud. But the focus on money laundering and on kleptocracy, despite the U.S.'s passage of legislation like the Magnitsky Act, which specifically sanctioned corrupt Russian officials, waned. In the White House, the Obama administration watched Russia bulldoze into Crimea and watched a regime in Syria bulldoze anti-government protesters. The administration spent its final few years just trying to maintain the post-Cold War order where it could. Dealing with new regimes, the kinds buoyed by kleptocratic dictatorships in places like Moscow and Damascus, sapped the administration's energies and political capital. With everything else happening in the world, the White House's initial focus on kleptocracy dwindled. And in New York, a figure stepped onto a golden escalator, lowering himself into a waiting throng of supporters, a man who claimed he wanted to drain the swamp, but who brought with him an addiction and a connection to dirty money that few could match. Part 4 United States of Anonymity Kleptocratic networks hold sway in military dictatorships and in apparent democracies, under leftist regimes, and in countries whose leadership champions ultra-free market capitalism. Like an invisible, odorless gas, the phenomenon has spread, unnoticed, throughout much of the world. Sarah Shays <laughs> 
Chapter 14 The Oligarchs Are Just Fronts America is the place I know best in the world. It's the only place I know in the world. Philip Roth In 1983, a doughy, mutton-chopped 32-year-old named Jean-Claude Duvalier had a problem. A dozen years earlier, Duvalier, known as Baby Doc to cronies and detractors alike, had ascended to the presidency of the Caribbean nation of Haiti following the death of his autocratic father. Almost immediately, Baby Doc smothered any talk of reform or hopes of democratization. As Haitians watched opposition activists go missing and independent media go silent, Baby Doc strangled any hopes that the country's democratic revolution of nearly two centuries prior would finally come to fruition. But Baby Doc wasn't a staid, stale dictator in his father's mold. He had a kind of malign joie de vivre, an almost sociopathic need to make the most of his time crushing his Haitian populace. A multi-million dollar wedding, perhaps the most lavish the Caribbean has ever seen, included a 101 cannon salute, $100,000 worth of fireworks, and, as the Washington Post reported, a setting that hid Haiti's poverty behind a facade of papier-mâché roses. In the years that followed, Duvalier dabbled in crimes against humanity including housing political prisoners in jails dubbed the Triangle of Death, where many of them suffered unspeakably painful deaths, while regime supporters made sure any critical journalists were tortured or exiled for their reporting. Looting state coffers, pillaging local populations, pocketing as much national wealth as he could stomach, Duvalier built a personal nest egg worth upward of $800 million, enough to place him alongside genocidaire like Slobodo Milosevic looted wealth $1 billion, and crooks like Peru's Alberto Fujimori looted wealth $600 million, among the great kleptocrats of the 20th century. Much of Baby Doc's looted wealth remained in Haiti proper, stashed in gold and banknotes. If this money had been invested in clean water projects, we would have saved so many thousands of lives, an investigator who tried to track Baby Doc's assets later related to me. That, to me, is the legacy when I think of Duvalier. With the help of a few friends, Baby Doc opened an American bank account and immediately began plowing his dirty millions through the till. The Americans he encountered in those days, before banks had to think twice about servicing dictators, no matter the blood dripping from their regimes, opened their doors easily to Baby Doc. Like another great kleptocratic American client of the era, the Philippines' Ferdinand Marcos, looted wealth, five to ten billion dollars, those in Washington happily embraced Duvalier in his nominal stand against communism. Still, Baby Doc didn't want to make his American investments too obvious. He signed up an American lawyer, Kevin McCarthy, who helped direct a shell company Baby Doc could use to obscure his finances. His American bank account kept growing, with millions in Haitians missing money congealing for Baby Doc's use. Like Theodorin, Baby Doc scouted South Florida for a yacht, splurging over $6 million in today's money on a schooner he liked. And like so many others, he eyed a place in New York. Smack in the middle of Manhattan, a new building offered a potential home for Baby Doc's dirty millions. Rising nearly 60 stories, the new tower, looking like a shard of obsidian rising in brick and brass midtown, wanted new tenants. One unit caught Baby Doc's eye. Located on the 54th floor, with stunning views of New York City, the pad cost approximately $6 million in today's dollars. This, the dictator decided, was the one he wanted. Baby Doc's lawyer went forward with the purchase, and on April 22, 1983, he inked the deed. There on the contract was the description of the unit, the signature of the notary present, and the details of the purchase itself. All formal, wrote stuff. But there, on the second page of the contract, hovering just above the names of Baby Doc's lawyer and shell company, was a scrawl Americans would become familiar with in the years to come. It belonged to a man who'd come to dominate America's luxury property market, America's reality television circuit, and in time, America's politics. It belonged to Donald Trump, the man who decided to sell this unit in Trump Tower to one of the most heinous despots the Western Hemisphere had ever seen. On that day in 1983, decades before Trump entered the White House and upended the entire trajectory of American democracy and American kleptocracy alike, 
Trump landed his first kleptocrat. It wouldn't be his last. While it will take years and potentially decades to get a full picture of Trump's financial history, it's clear that Trump's properties in the U.S. alone may have laundered billions of dollars even before he ascended to the White House. According to the most comprehensive analysis available, Trump's American properties sold over 1,300 units, over one-fifth of Trump's total available condos, to buyers matching money laundering profiles, anonymously, to shell companies and cash buyers, often purchased in bulk and without ever revealing the identities of the ultimate beneficiaries. Even today, thanks to the secrecy regime still in place in the U.S., only a small fraction of the ultimate owners of these Trump units has been disclosed. The final bill of these suspect purchases ran to a dumbfounding $1.5 billion, and that's before adjusting for inflation. It seems like every single one of Trump's American properties happily feasted on the diluvial flood of dirty money coming into the U.S. over the past few decades. Take Trump Tower in New York, for instance. Baby Doc was hardly the only one who viewed the building as a potential personal laundromat. Nearly a quarter of the building's total unit sales went to buyers who, like Baby Doc, fit the money laundering profile. Total value of such sales? $30 million. Or pop over to the west side of Manhattan, where Trump erected the Trump International Hotel and Tower in 1996, one of his keystone properties, dominating Columbus Circle and Central Park's southwest corner. Nearly 30% of that building's unit sales went to buyers who fit money laundering profiles. The total value of such sales? $135 million. Or what about Trump World Tower, one of Trump's newest Manhattan constructs? Hugging the island's eastern border, overlooking the East River, Trump opened the building in 2001. And he made sure to open it to the kinds of buyers who'd long treated him and his building so well. Some 10% of the building's unit sales went to those same kinds of anonymous buyers, the ones eager to take advantage of the kleptocratic tools the U.S. provides in spades. Total value of such sales? $110 million. Or look at any of the other Trump buildings sprinkled across Manhattan like structural smallpox. Trump Park Avenue took in $80 million from these suspect buyers. Trump Palace Condominiums took in another $43 million. Trump Park netted another $51 million. Trump Soho, Trump's newest Manhattan building and the New York construct most closely affiliated with the entire Trump family, appears to have been built solely to service these anonymous clients. After opening in 2010, a staggering 77% of unit sales went to buyers who fit money laundering profiles, raking in $110 million. Trump Soho was, as one lawsuit said about the building, a monument to spectacularly corrupt money laundering and tax evasion. But it's not as if these sales were limited to Trump properties in New York alone. In a nod to the fact that transnational money laundering is a truly American phenomenon, the suspect purchases tied to Trump properties took place across the country. In Florida, Trump Hollywood, tucked along the Atlantic shoreline, opened in 2009 flinging nearly half of its units to anonymous buyers, bringing in $136 million along the way. A bit farther south, Trump Grand One, which opened in 2008, let one-third of its unit sales go to these suspicious buyers for some $105 million. That same year, a trio of other Trump Florida properties, known a bit blandly as Trump Towers 1, 2, and 3, netted $291 million from buyers that fit traditional money laundering models. Look wherever you want, and the pattern repeats itself. Trump International Hotel Waikiki in Hawaii. Nearly 20% of sales went to these buyers for $161 million. Trump International Hotel and Tower in Chicago. Nearly 15% of sales went to these buyers for $93 million. Trump International Hotel Las Vegas. Over 20% of sales went to these buyers for $56 million. It was American kleptocracy in miniature, American kleptocracy in a single person, who eventually used the proceeds of these suspect sales to help build a war chest that would launch him to the presidency. Some of these shell companies chomping through Trump properties, 
like the one funneling Baby Doc's dirty money, were based elsewhere, in places like Panama or the British Virgin Islands. But plenty of suspect buyers took full advantage of using anonymous American shell companies to purchase anonymous American real estate. Delaware, for instance, provided shell companies for some 75 separate Trump-related purchases, good for keeping nearly $130 million perfectly anonymous. Not that Trump was himself any stranger to Delaware's services. Trump turned to the state time and again for his corporate needs, registering some 378 companies in the state for all sorts of corporate and tax minimization schemes. It's a lot, Trump would later admit, though how many other anonymous Delaware shell companies Trump himself personally oversaw is anyone's guess. And of course, Trump's been repeatedly connected to a range of other Delaware shells, even the ones he doesn't nominally oversee. When it emerged in 2018 that Trump had helped steer $130,000 in hush money to former porn actress Stormy Daniels, his since-jailed lawyer, Michael Cohen, knew which state to turn to to suit their anonymous purposes, Delaware. All of it, all this American anonymity, all these shell companies and real estate purchases, all this American kleptocracy wrapped up in a single, blustering developer from Queens, New York, for the benefit of the man who would one day be president. As mentioned earlier, the identities of hundreds and hundreds of those behind the anonymous purchases of Trump-related properties still remain unclear, shrouded in shell company secrecy. Still, like Baby Doc, a couple of names have slipped from behind the curtain of the secrecy regime in place, largely due either to court cases unveiling their names or Trump's own manic willingness to announce partnerships and new clients regardless of the other party's background, connection to looted wealth, or clear criminality. For instance, there was David Bogatin, a former Soviet military veteran best known for working as a Russian organized crime figure who ran scams across Brooklyn, New York. Bogatin also worked as an ally of the morbidly obese Simeon Mogilevich, perhaps the leading Russian mafia figure in the entire world. When Bogatin looked to park some of his ill-gotten money in the U.S., he had a clear outlet purchasing multiple units in Trump Tower, enriching the future president with no questions asked. Another similar figure, Edward Nektalov, emerged around the turn of the century as a key figure in a Treasury Department investigation into Colombian money laundering operations. Before being executed at the hands of a hitman in 2004, Nektalov had moved millions directly into a building he knew would keep it safe, Trump World Tower. Nektalov owned a unit directly beneath Trump's future mealy mouthpiece, Kellyanne Conway. There's also Vyacheslav Ivankov, a scruffy, scraggly, former Siberian prison camp exile. Another Mogilevich ally, Ivankov arrived in the U.S. in 1992 and proceeded to consolidate the Russian mafiosi on American soil. For years, Ivankov dodged FBI investigators, even after they'd fingered him as the man responsible for spreading the Russian mob's influence across the U.S. At last, the FBI discovered Ivankov's headquarters, Trump Tower. This was the building from which Ivankov chose to operate, steering a global criminal conglomerate before being murdered by a sniper on the streets of Moscow. It's worth noting that not all of Trump's questionable financial connections to suspect Russian figures came via his hotels or towers. In 2008, Trump offloaded a swank Florida mansion to a Russian oligarch named Dmitry Ryblovlev, a deal that netted Trump an incredible $54 million in profit in the most expensive residential sale the U.S. had ever seen at that point. Trump, however, appeared savvy enough to be able to identify whose money he was really helping to process. As Trump later quipped to his lawyer, the oligarchs are just fronts for Putin. Not that Trump's sordid clients and partners were limited to his American buildings. The soon-to-be president had a penchant for partnering with the most corrupt actors he could find abroad. He also built a habit of exporting his laundering model to other locales, other markets, other countries, to other populations that might require his laundering services. For instance, there was a planned Trump Tower on the Black Sea coast of the nation of Georgia. That project saw Trump link up with a figure widely viewed as one of the most corrupt actors in the entire post-Soviet space, Timur Kalibiev, a Kazakhstani national 
whose net worth bulged into the billions after marrying into Kazakhstan's thuggish dictator's family. While the planned Black Sea resort eventually fell through, Trump's connections to flows of suspect money out of Kazakhstan, a country suffering under decades of dictatorship, with few political or civil freedoms to citizens' names, extended back to his American properties, where another Kazakhstani official accused of massive embezzlement picked up a number of Trump Soho properties. Likewise, ongoing plans for a Trump International Hotel and Tower in Bali have involved a partnership with an Indonesian national named Harry Tanosadibio. Despite governmental allegations of substantial tax fraud, and despite the fact that he was banned from leaving Indonesia after threatening one of Indonesia's most prominent officials, Trump decided to enlist Tenosidibio's services for the supposedly six-star project. The Georgia and Indonesia projects point to the natural extension of Trump's American business model. But it's two projects elsewhere that helped cement Trump's kleptocratic bona fides, at least among the international set. Both of these other projects also roped Trump's family into his personal laundering operations, transforming the Trump kleptocratic project into a familial one and ushering in a new generation of Trumps intimately familiar with what it takes to build a paper empire on the back of dirty money. First, there was Panama. The Trump Ocean Club project in Panama City, completed in 2011, brought the Trump organization to one of the most notoriously corrupt countries in Central America. Not only did Baby Doc set up his shell company in Panama, but in 2016, the so-called Panama Papers, which we saw in Chapter 3, memorably spilled the secrets of the country's entire offshoring industry. The 70-foot, sail-shaped complex was the family's largest project in actually all of the Americas, Ivanka Trump, Trump's daughter, once boasted. She would know, too. The building, according to Trump, was destined to be Ivanka's baby. Indeed, Ivanka was intimately involved in the creation and associated sales of the Panamanian building. The building's primary broker, Alexandre Enrique Ventura Noguera claimed that he met with Ivanka at least ten times to discuss the Panamanian project, adding that Ivanka was the primary figure responsible for all aspects of the Trump Ocean Club deal. As the anti-corruption watchdog Global Witness wrote, the building came with Ivanka's personal touch. As Ivanka laughed in a promotional video, some people say the building resembles a giant D. One problem, though. The signs of money laundering affiliated with the building were as bright and blinding as anything in the Western Hemisphere and as anything connected to Trump elsewhere. Not only were many units purchased in cash or via anonymous shell companies, including, as with Trump's New York properties, buyers linked to Russian organized crime, but many were likewise purchased in bulk, another traditional sign of money laundering. Some sales were even conducted via so-called bearer shares, tools so closely affiliated with money laundering operations that they've been banned across multiple jurisdictions. Bearer shares allow the holders of certain pieces of paper to be the legal owners of the shell company in question. All one has to do is hand off the paper, and the company's ownership and control has been successfully transferred. As one of the global witness investigators who uncovered the dirty money scheme said, we found that there were some pretty consistent signs of money laundering. Or take it from Ventura Noguera, the man who liaced with Ivanka time and again. As he later confessed, When I was in Panama, I was regularly laundering money for more than a dozen companies. The center for all this graft? Ivanka's Panamanian baby. Ivanka doesn't talk about the building much these days, not least because the Trump Organization lost its claims to the building in 2018 following a management dispute. A similar story played out in Azerbaijan a country already steered by one of the most kleptocratic regimes in the entire world. Trump's efforts at creating a Trump Tower in the capital city of Baku ended up so poorly managed that the deal became, as the New Yorker dubbed it, Trump's worst. It's not hard to see why. Not only did the Trumps work closely with the family of Azeri oligarch Zia Mamedov, a man dubbed by American diplomats as notoriously corrupt, even for Azerbaijan, but as reporter Adam Davidson found, the building's construction may well have been used to launder funds for members of Iran's Revolutionary Guard, breaking American anti-bribery law along the way. The entire Baku deal is a giant red flag, an assistant dean at George Washington University Law School told Davidson.
corruption warning signs are rarely more obvious. The person who oversaw the building's construction? Ivanka, naturally. She publicly claimed that the Trump project in Azerbaijan would make for an exciting addition to the Trump Organization's expanding portfolio. She personally approved everything, one Azeri lawyer involved in the project said. Trump's daughter even posted updates from the building directly to her own Instagram, where she described it as, my project. But when word began getting around of all the corruption Ivanka had apparently overlooked on behalf of her father, and when the project itself began falling apart, both physically and figuratively, she tried to scrub her website of any evidence in her involvement. Of course, the investigators, participants, and buyers looking to move and hide and launder their ill-gotten gains don't forget. When it came to Trump-related properties, the details of these schemes only piled up, and all of them pointed to one inescapable conclusion. Few Americans had profited as much from American kleptocracy and from the dirty money linked directly to corrupt oligarchs and officials and mafiosi abroad as the Trump family. In many ways, kleptocracy built Trump's empire, and by the mid-2010s, Trump wanted it to help build something else, a political empire, one that could cement America's transformation and continue it for generations to come. The U.S.'s 2016 presidential campaign was memorable for any number of reasons, from Trump blathering his way to the GOP nomination to fake Russian Facebook feeds targeting white nationalists and Texas secessionists alike. But there's one other figure who's worth pausing on, another figure who rode Trump's campaign coattails to a resurgence in relevance and ultimately to his own doom. Paul Manafort. The lobbyist had become something of a forgotten entity in Washington by the time Trump tapped him to lead the 2016 campaign. He'd advised George H.W. Bush and Bob Dole on their respective presidential campaigns, but after that he'd kept a low profile, in the U.S. at least. Abroad, Manafort spent his time slithering from one foreign lobbying client to the next, always available to the highest bidder. For instance, he helped whitewash Ferdinand Marcos, one of the greatest kleptocrats of the 20th century. He helped launder the reputation of Nigerian brute Sani Abacha, looted wealth, two to five billion dollars, including money his wife tried to whisk out of the country in 38 different suitcases. He even got to help spin Mobutu Sese Seko, the Zairean despot who joined Baby Doc, Slobodan Milosevic, and others in spending their years looting national coffers and running their millions through Western laundering machines. Indeed, Manafort's roster of clients, the blood-sodded monsters he helped transform into bespoke leaders, feigning interest in things like human rights and democracy, grew so notorious that it eventually comprised what others called the torturer's lobby. There was one other client, though, who helped shore up Manafort's kleptocratic resume in the lead-up to the 2016 election. Ukraine's Viktor Yanukovych, the would-be autocrat we met in Chapter 11. Thanks to Manafort's help, Yanukovych proved victorious in the country's 2010 election. Shortly afterward, he promptly began dismantling Ukraine's fragile democracy. He helped launch an immediate investigation into his political rival, Yulia Tymoshenko. When Western nations decried the move, Manafort helped broker an arrangement between Yanukovych's regime and a powerhouse American law firm, Skadden Arps, in order to spin the investigation as something perfectly normal. The man who bankrolled the operation, Ukrainian oligarch Viktor Pinchuk, used Manafort's shell company to hide the payment, according to DOJ filings. Pinchuk denied any financial link to Manafort, despite testimony and filings indicating otherwise. For a while, the move worked. Yanukovych managed to kneecap his political rival. Manafort kept getting paid for his services, using his shell companies, including a number in Delaware, to disguise his financial flows. Ukraine's coffers slowly bled funds, its budget drying up, with some of the looted funds heading towards Yanukovych's new palatial estates and others heading for Manafort's multiple shell companies and multiple secret bank accounts. Their partnership seemed a match made in kleptocratic heaven. Then it all fell apart. The protesters who toppled Yanukovych also sent Manafort scampering back to the U.S. After Ukraine's revolution, Manafort hid out in the U.S., slithering back to his home country. His former clients, Mobutu and Marcos, Abacha, and now Yanukovych, had all been ousted by successful anti-authoritarian protests 
all toppled because of their corruption and bloody criminality. No new clients appeared on the horizon, and despite all the secret payments, Manafort still had bills coming due. He had Russian oligarchs knocking on his door, asking about deals Manafort had reneged on. He had tax authorities beginning to ask questions, wondering about where he'd gotten the money for certain real estate purchases. The walls had begun closing in on him. But then, in June 2016, Manafort received a phone call. A flagging Republican candidate for president was looking for help, for someone to shore up his listing campaign. Few gave the candidate much chance. What did the lobbyists think? What would he recommend? Would he perhaps consider becoming the new campaign manager? Manafort didn't hesitate. He agreed to become Trump's campaign manager. The man who'd spent more of his life than anyone else whitewashing foreign kleptocrats agreed to help a man who'd profited perhaps more than anyone else from America's collapse into money-laundering nirvana. Both of them eyed the White House and everything that comes with it. Both of them knew what could be accomplished with the levers of power in their hands. Both of them knew what could be achieved and how much they could implode the U.S.'s anti-corruption regime and open the U.S. to all the dirty money they could find if only Donald Trump could win the presidency. Chapter 15 Corruption in the Flesh The official, if unspoken, policy was to let the rottenness grow rather than risk the dangers involved in exposure and cleanup. Elliot Asinoff In June 2018, back in Equatorial Guinea, strobe lights glanced around a crowd of onlookers Dozens deep as they danced around a catwalk stage. Here in Malabo, Equatorial Guinea's capital, the crust of Obiang's kleptocracy gathered. Officials and hangers-on, bartenders in miniskirts, and men in white tuxedos, swirling underneath chandeliers and flanked by twenty-foot-high holograms bouncing to the music. Hundreds of bottles of alcohol lined the stage, like boozy cattails in a drunken wetland. Creamy leather couches surrounded a cake shaped like a Rolex, while leggy women in feathered carnival headdresses shimmied past glittering, star-spangled walls. The dance floor pooled with swaying visitors, sweat beginning to mist around them, bass shuddering the entire room. It was a party that would have made Jay Gatsby blush, and it was meant to celebrate one thing, Teodoran's 50th birthday. It had been four years since the kleptocrat found himself exiled from his Malibu pad, he was already the poster child for kleptocracy, as all those around him well knew. And yet, here in Malabo, it felt like nothing had changed. Theodoran's visions of celebrity lived and danced and reveled as they ever had. But if he couldn't enjoy those dreams in the U.S., maybe he could bring a bit of the U.S. with him. The music paused, drunken attendees tilting as they turned to the stage. There, a man in a white dress shirt and dark tie grabbed a microphone, Happy birthday, he began, in an American accent, addressing Theodoran. Greatly appreciate the invite. We gonna set this thing on fire. The camera that captured this moment zoomed in. The man on the stage raised his fist. As a matter of fact, everybody that's born in Africa, make some noise if you're born in Africa. Rising shrieks greet him. Oh, hell yeah, the American responds. He continues, talking about how he's been to Africa plenty of times, but that this is his first time in Malabo. As the camera gets closer, you can see that he's wearing sunglasses and has close-cropped hair, and that there's a hype man beginning to bounce and wriggle behind him. It's Chris Bridges, who goes by the stage name Ludacris. Ludacris, to be fair, was hardly the only celebrity Theodoran convinced to come to Malabo to celebrate another trip around the sun for one of the most corrupt figures the world has ever produced. There's Jeezy, another prominent rapper originally from Atlanta, performing on stage, dodging the towering holograms. There's Akon, American crooner, trying to get the crowd to bop with him. There's Sean Kingston, a thick-set, one-hit wonder, serenading with Beautiful Girls, the only song of his anyone remembers. It's great to be here in front of my beautiful African people, Kingston yells from the stage, wearing a Scrooge McDuck shirt. Now we're gonna turn this shit up. All of them there to perform for and to celebrate a man Washington accused of being one of the most obvious kleptocrats to ever visit the U.S. Nobody knows how much Theodoran paid these men. None of their representatives responded to my questions. And they're hardly the first American stars to perform for despots around the world, 
Beyonce performed for the horrific Gaddafi family. Hilary Swank attended the birthday party of the Chechen warlord Ramzan Kadyrov. Mariah Carey and Nicki Minaj have both schmoozed with Angola's former despotic family ruling Angola. Britney Spears even once waited, cramped and uncomfortable, inside a giant birthday cake to surprise a Malaysian kleptocrat named Joe Lowe, who was later targeted in one of the DOJ's biggest anti-kleptocracy actions to date. Theodorn's birthday, though, was a measure apart. Never before had such a constellation of star power gathered for one kleptocrat, there, dancing and clapping in a plum tuxedo jacket and yellow baseball hat turned sideways. Never before had dirty money, when it comes to wooing American celebrities evidently unconcerned about the source of the funds, gone so far. After all, there were no regulations pertaining to American celebrities or their agents checking the source of the millions they accept. Why would they ever do otherwise? It's not that Theodorin's 2018 party pointed specifically to the failures of America's anti-kleptocracy efforts. It's that the event sums up so much of those failures and so many of the struggles of modern counter-kleptocracy efforts. To be sure, the U.S.'s efforts against Theodorin, with all the guns of the Kleptocracy Asset Recovery Initiative aimed at him, initially appeared as a success. With Theodorin effectively banned from the U.S. by the Obama administration, and with his mansion and much of his roster of assets seized, the DOJ had done exactly what its Kleptocracy Asset Recovery Initiative was meant to do. Identify the stolen assets, seize and freeze them, and return them to the people from whom they were stolen. In this case, Theodorin and the DOJ agreed that tens of millions of dollars that he'd thieved and laundered in the U.S. would be given to a charitable organization in Equatorial Guinea, helping some of the people he and his father and his entire family had pummeled and plundered for decades. The U.S. settlement sounded a starter gun for the other countries to start going after Theodorin's pilfered assets as well. French authorities seized a multi-million dollar pad in Paris, with a French court even sentencing the kleptocrat to a three-year suspended jail term. Swiss authorities opened their own investigation into Theodorin and discovered that he'd parked dozens of his high-end cars on Swiss soil, which were promptly seized. Even when trying to travel, Theodorin was suddenly tripped up. During a trip to South America following the U.S. settlement, Brazilian authorities seized 20 diamond-studded watches Theodorin had decided to bring with him, totaling some $15 million in value. The Equatorial Guinea Embassy claimed the watches were for personal use. For a bit, it appeared that the gears of a nascent global counter-kleptocracy regime had begun to turn against Theodorin. The poster child of modern kleptocracy had turned into the poster child of what counter-kleptocracy efforts, with the U.S. at the helm, could achieve. Equatorial Guinea still retained some of the world's highest illiteracy and poverty rates and still suffered under the boot heel of one of the world's longest dictatorships. But at least the U.S. had made an example of Theodorin, both for those in Equatorial Guinea and for those around the world considering using the U.S. as their dirty money playground. And then, in May 2018, Theodorin suddenly appeared in Times Square. Smiling like a Cheshire cat, Bedecked in all black and scoping out women in high heels, Theodorin was back in his favorite playground, freely spending his dirty money once more. Recently promoted by his father to the vice presidency, Theodorin told American officials that he had returned to the U.S. as a simple diplomat, there to attend the United Nations General Assembly, there to do only what diplomatic immunity allowed him. But that was just an excuse. He'd swing by the U.N., claiming Equatorial Guinea was on its way to full democracy. But after that, he'd spend time visiting his old haunts. Which is exactly what happened. Even after the U.S. tried to make Theodorin the keystone of the global anti-kleptocracy push, here he was, back in the same country that had tried, and apparently failed, to banish him and his dirty money. It's not as if Theodorin was subtle about it. Guy Christian Agbor, a former legal advisor to Equatorial Guinea's American embassy, said he visited Theodorin at New York's Ritz-Carlton, where he walked in on Theodorin gorging on caviar and champagne. He threw money on the bed there in his suite, Agbor remembered. You open the door to the room, and you see the money on the bed. Two million dollars, just sitting there on the bed. In Hawaii, he took surfing lessons, stopped by a luau, slow rode a bike down white sand beaches. In Las Vegas, he continued the party, soaking in the debauchery, 
swimming amid thousands of others at an outdoor music festival. Even, according to those tracking him in the U.S., throwing his own hotel party that saw one partygoer overdose and die. This detail remains unconfirmed, though Theodoran did post a photo of a shirtless, shoeless man lying prone in a Las Vegas hotel hallway. Only in Vegas, he captioned. It was as if the past few years and all the energy the U.S. had expended on its counter-kleptocracy efforts had never happened. I shouldn't be surprised Obiang is still in the U.S. and spending all that money in Hawaii and Vegas. Laura Stuber, the Senate investigator who tracked down Teodoran and Pinochet and all those others years before, told me, It's just disgusting. Teodoran is never, ever going to change. Agbor, who has pushed efforts to seize the Obiang family's assets, added, The only thing that will make him change is if he gets arrested or locked up. Other than that, he's never going to change. I know the man. I've talked to the man. Have you ever had a chance to talk to a drug dealer? Just doing what he wants? Taking women left and right? That's how Teodoran operates. And it's not just that Teodoran was back, making a mockery of U.S. efforts to counter him and his corruption and his kind. The other corrupt foreign figures highlighted during the 2010 Senate investigations, those specifically selected alongside Teodoran to illustrate who'd been taking advantage of this American kleptocracy, were still enjoying themselves in the U.S., a decade after they were specifically targeted by American officials. Atiku Abubakar, the wildly corrupt Nigerian official who secretly funneled tens of millions of dollars into the U.S., hired pro-Trump lobbyists and stayed at Trump properties in Washington in order to curry favor with the White House. And the Bongo family, which has pillaged the African country of Gabon for years, has continued to plop down millions to purchase American properties with their dirty money, with nobody batting an eye. Meanwhile, a decade after the investigation into Teodoran's American assets began, and nearly two decades after the Riggs Bank scandal first broke, Equatoguineans still haven't seen a single cent of Teodoran's stolen funds returned. We still don't have any disposition of what happened, Ken Hurwitz, the American lawyer who'd helped track Teodoran's assets, told me about the tens of millions of dollars the Americans were supposed to return. Hurwitz pointed out that Teodoran and his father have still refused to sign off on the repatriation. As a practical matter, Teodoran is saying, Fuck you, the lawyer said. He has no incentive for that money to be returned to the Equatoguinean people. Nor would Teodoran's family want to encourage the DOJ in its efforts. After all, even after journalists and investigators exposed the entire ruling regime, American real estate agents remained perfectly happy to continue cycling the Obiang's money, to continue laundering it into American assets regardless of its source. As of 2020, President Obiang, Teodoran's father, still owns a pair of multi-million dollar homes in Potomac, Maryland, including one right next door to a mansion owned by former Gambian dictator Yahya Jame. These properties are located in a twist you couldn't make up next to Democracy Boulevard. But maybe, as Stuber said, this shouldn't have been surprising. After all, around the same time, a new figure in Washington had set about annihilating America's entire anti-corruption and anti-kleptocracy bona fides. Trump, to be fair, wasn't technically the first White House tenant who profited from the world of offshoring while in office. Former President Richard Nixon was a customer at the Bahamas Castle Bank and Trust, perhaps the shadiest bank in the entire Caribbean. When an IRS informant, investigating the largest tax evasion scheme in American history, discovered Nixon's name among the reams of clients at the offshore bank, Nixon's hand-picked IRS chief promptly quashed the investigations. According to one of his mobbed-up buddies, Nixon was very angry with the discovery. A bank source later revealed that the firm had moved millions of dollars into a separate Swiss account on behalf of the one linked to Nixon. But Nixon's offshore dalliances simply set the stage for what we saw blossom under Trump. If Nixon set the example, Trump blasted it into the stratosphere. Once he was installed in the White House, Trump acted as a battering ram against the entire edifice of the U.S.'s anti-corruption architecture. In only four years, Trump became a detonator that imploded America's reputation as an anti-corruption leader, a reputation four decades in the making. Trump's efforts to dismantle America's anti-corruption program began almost as soon as he entered the White House. Take his treatment of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, FCPA, for instance. 
ushered in during the aftermath of Nixon's Watergate scandal, the FCPA, which bars American companies and figures from bribing foreign officials, remains the linchpin of America's broader anti-corruption efforts. Yet Trump entered the presidency having already publicly declared the FCPA a horrible law. The only other president to enter office pledging to repeal the FCPA? Ronald Reagan. Almost immediately, Trump set about attempting to dismantle the entire act. In the spring of 2017, Trump enthused to Secretary of State Rex Tillerson that he wanted the FCPA scrapped entirely. I need you to get rid of that law, Trump bleated to Tillerson. Trump then ordered one of his advisors to author an executive order to that effect, all but eviscerating America's pro-transparency reputation from the outset of his presidency. Luckily, thanks to the regulatory structure and broad bipartisan support the FCPA still enjoys, Trump's efforts went nowhere. But that didn't stop FCPA-related actions from slowing considerably under Trump. As anti-corruption expert Alexandra Reagy said in 2020, the FCPA pipeline is thinning out dramatically. If Trump couldn't decapitate the program, maybe he could slowly strangle it with no one noticing. Trump's move was a clear shot across the bow of America's anti-corruption standing, which only went downhill from there. Around the same time, he announced the U.S. would be pulling back from the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, EITI, the leading and previously American-led multinational group dedicated to cleaning up the oil, gas, and mining sectors, which comprise the most notoriously corrupt industries on the planet. We're walking away from something we've been telling other countries to do for years, one anti-corruption activist said. Simultaneously, Trump signed a formal repeal of a raft of regulations, including the commitment from U.S. oil and gas companies to disclose payments to foreign officials, officials like, say, the Obiang family, which remains reliant on oil extraction to fuel their rapine kleptocracy. The previous regulations had been a beacon of U.S. leadership in the global fight against oil and mining corruption, Global Witness wrote. With Trump, though, they were suddenly snuffed out. Trump's move was, Oxfam wrote, a handout for kleptocrats, which plays into the hands of corrupt politicians, compromised bureaucrats, and insider lobbyists who thrive on secrecy. On and on, Trump battered American anti-corruption regulations, American anti-corruption legacies, American anti-corruption precedents. On and on, he spun American anti-corruption efforts straight into the ground, all while simultaneously claiming to be leading anti-corruption efforts to drain the swamp. And then there were the hotels, the towers, the Trump-related properties that no previous president had ever brought with them to the White House. Never before had assets, let alone those serving as key nodes in American kleptocracy, presented such a direct highway of financing into an American president's pockets. Trump claimed that he wanted nothing to do with his business as president, that he'd placed his stake in a blind trust in order to sever American and Trumpian interests. Such spin was, of course, a farce. Trump continued profiting from his company while he was president and could continue dropping in to manage the business, and woo more kleptocrats whenever he wanted. His buildings presented a throughway for kleptocrats to directly influence the most powerful man in the world, just keeping up with the foreign governments, the foreign officials, and the foreign figures patronizing and propping up Trump's properties while he was president was an exhausting exercise. There were the formal delegations that hosted events at Trump properties, governments from places like Afghanistan and Kuwait cordoning off entire sections of Trump's buildings for their own use. There were the paid-off lobbyists renting out entire sheaves of Trump properties, like the Saudi lobbyist who paid for 500 rooms at a Trump hotel shortly after Trump's election. There were the foreign Trump properties that continued shoveling money toward the president. Places like Trump Towers Istanbul, which fed millions from Turkey directly to Trump while president. Millions Americans only learned about in 2020, after Trump's tax returns finally spilled out. There were also the premiers and presidents and prime ministers who realized that paying for a stay at a Trump hotel was the best way to get into the president's good graces. People like Romanian Prime Minister Viorica Dancula and former Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak, the latter of whom played a key role in looting billions from Malaysia's sovereign wealth fund, who both shacked up at Trump's D.C. hotel.
even those already specifically cited by Congress for their stupefying corruption, like Nigeria's Atiku Abubakar, popped up at Trump Properties, helping bankroll a Trump organization that continued its willingness to house kleptocrats, regardless of previous congressional investigations into their financial malfeasance. And then, of course, there was the anonymity. As soon as Trump won the GOP nomination in the summer of 2016, the anonymous sales at his businesses erupted. One study from USA Today, published in the summer of 2017, discovered that after Trump took the nomination, the majority of his company's real estate sales went to secretive shell companies that obscure the buyer's identities. Investigators discovered that a stunning 70% of new Trump tenants hid behind anonymous LLCs, with some purchases running up to $10 million at a time, all sold to new clients whose names and sources of income remained completely unknown. Or, put another way, during his pre-presidency days, only one building, Trump Soho, saw a majority of its sales go to anonymous purchasers. After Trump's path to the presidency appeared clear, nearly three-quarters of all new sales instantly went to anonymous buyers. Who were these new buyers? The short answer is, we don't know. We have no idea who the vast majority of these purchasers were, or where they came from, or where they got their money, or what they wanted, or how they impacted American policy. It was the American kleptocratic story, spun up by multiple magnitudes, and spun directly into the White House. We do have an inkling, though, of who stood behind some of the anonymous purchases blanketing Trump properties. In 2019, Global Witness, one of the leading pro-transparency organizations extant, revealed that Claudia Sasu Ngeso, the rotund daughter of Congolese dictator Denis Sasu Ngeso, secretly controlled a shell company called Sebrit Limited. Sebrit itself acted as a front for a separate LLC called Asperbrus, which just so happened to be on the receiving end of over half a billion dollars thieved from the Congolese treasury. Sebrit directed the funds to yet another American shell company, itself registered by K&L Gates, an American law firm. A corrupt ruling Central African family using American shell companies and American law firms to help hide their money in American real estate. Sound familiar? From there, the American shell company finalized a luxury apartment purchase in a behemoth building overlooking a chunk of Central Park, Trump International Hotel and Tower. But that wasn't all. Trump International Realty even brokered the sale, the final step allowing the millions in dirty money looted from languishing Congolese to run through yet another Trump property, washed clean with a chunk of it finding its way directly into Trump's wallet. It appears, therefore, that Claudia Sasu Ngeso owns the Trump apartment, paid with suspected stolen state funds, Global Witness relayed. The question now is, did the background checks fail to raise the alarm, or did the Trump companies choose to look the other way? Given Trump's business model, the answer appears clear. Not that Trump, or any of his underlings, was under any legal requirements to check Sasu Ngeso's finances, or run any basic anti-money laundering checks or that Trump was ever aware that she'd purchased the unit. This is still American real estate, after all. This is still the industry benefiting most spectacularly from America's descent into money laundering heaven. And that's only one apartment, one multi-million dollar investment on one of dozens of floors, in one of dozens of buildings linked directly to Trump. One small building block in an entire portfolio increasingly reliant on anonymous funds one singular moment of laundering for the benefit of not only a brutal ruling regime elsewhere, but for the man who, as president, helped disembowel American anti-corruption policy and build a new pro-kleptocracy legacy in its stead. The man who had become, as Senator Elizabeth Warren dubbed him, corruption in the flesh, and the man who would try to bring American kleptocracy to its logical and tragic end. Chapter 16. Open Season President Putin and the Russian Security Services operate like a super PAC. Fiona Hill By the time Trump entered the White House, Ihor Kolomoisky was on the run. Even with his personal militia, even with his power base carved out of central Ukraine, the investigations into Kolomoisky's steering of Privatbank 
and the $5.5 billion hold that authorities discovered, sending them scrambling to nationalize the bank, proved too hot for the oligarch-turned-warlord. He skipped first to Switzerland, holing up in Geneva, and then hopped to Tel Aviv, where he enjoyed Israeli citizenship. Popular revulsion against the oligarch began brewing in Ukraine proper. The one-time patriot had morphed, in the span of only a few months, into a kind of synecdoche for the entire corrupt roster of oligarchs still running the country. Kolomoisky the hero had transformed into Kolomoisky the warlord, Kolomoisky the scapegoat, Kolomoisky the enemy. It was a role the oligarch appeared happy to embrace. Outside Ukraine, Kolomoisky began lobbing public calls for Ukraine to default on much-needed loans from the International Monetary Fund, IMF, claiming Kiev could stand on its own and that it didn't need any Western financial support, coming as it did with demands for domestic transparency and anti-corruption reforms. The IMF just so happened to be demanding that Kolomoisky never return to a leadership position at Privatbank, for instance. The oligarch also abruptly began flipping his rhetoric about Russia. In an interview with the New York Times, Kolomoisky sounded like a leopard who'd changed his spots, calling for Kiev to rebuild ties with the country that had invaded and decimated Ukraine's eastern and southern flanks. Give it five, ten years, and the blood will be forgotten, Kolomoisky said. And if the U.S. or the IMF kept pushing anti-corruption reforms, or, if they get smart with us, we'll go to Russia. As Kolomoisky added, Moscow was stronger anyway. Russian tanks will be stationed near Poland. Your NATO will be soiling its pants and buying pampers. Nor was this all bluster. Back in Kiev, Valeria Gontareva, who'd led the investigation into Privatbank, started discovering threatening messages around her home. One day, there was a piece of graffiti on a wall outside her house calling her a Russian pig. Another tag sprayed the word killer with dollar signs scribbled around. Her home itself was vandalized. And then... One morning, she encountered a piece of Kolomoisky's threat portfolio that his rivals had once experienced, an open coffin containing an effigy of Gontareva clad in black and white stripes, a black bouquet placed near her feet, sitting outside the doors of the Ukrainian Central Bank, waiting for her to arrive to work. No one claimed responsibility for the threats, nor for the effigy, nor for the sudden upsurge in pressure to get her to pull back from the investigations into certain oligarchs looting Ukrainian depositors and cycling their dirty money through the U.S. But Gontareva, who outlasted a number of post-revolution finance ministers who couldn't handle the stress, had her suspicions. I'm like the Fenimore Cooper novel, Last of the Mohicans, she said. I was called a killer of oligarchs. Soon, though, the threats metastasized. In London, where Gontareva is now living, a car ran directly into her, sending her to the hospital. Just a few weeks later, her home in Ukraine burned to the ground. Investigations into both proved inconclusive, but it wasn't too much to imagine that a man she'd outed for allegedly running one of the world's greatest Ponzi schemes might be involved. All the while, an entire buffet of cases regarding Kolomoisky's alleged swindle continued. Lawsuits laying out Kolomoisky and the Optima family's use of American assets to launder their ill-gotten gains burst forth in the U.S., from former partners and Privat Bank's new owners alike. In Ukraine, lawsuits fingered the laundering operations, with legal filings even popping up in places like the UK. Kolomoisky denied any allegations of impropriety and counterpunched by demanding control of the bank once more. These suits and countersuits all took place while the details of the alleged swindle continued to leak out, leaving battered and beleaguered Ukrainians watching from the sidelines. Kolomoisky, though, spied a potential out. The post-revolution administration of Petro Poroshenko began faltering, growing increasingly unpopular as Ukraine's economic heaves and inability to dislodge Russia became more pronounced. By early 2019, a new challenger rose to unseat him. Volodymyr Zelensky, a cherubic, 40-year-old comedian, had no prior political experience, no previous attachment to any administrations or previous regimes. Instead, he had something Ukrainian politicos had long lacked charisma. He knew how to work audiences. He knew how to charm voters who'd watched him play a Ukrainian president on television for years. And come April, Zelensky, who'd pledged greater Western engagement, proved that he knew how to do something else, win a presidential election, and do so in a landslide. The comedian routed the oligarch in that year's election, 
taking nearly 75% of the vote over Poroshenko. Instantly, Ukraine's pro-Western, pro-reform agenda appeared assured. Zelensky promised change and transparency and fealty to voters rather than to the oligarchic class that had long gutted the country. Ukraine, nearly three decades after the Soviet collapse, finally appeared on the right footing. But there was one catch. Zelensky himself may not have been an oligarch, and he may not have been involved in any of those previous schemes to loot the country's coffers. But there was one oligarch who appeared in Zelensky's shadow, peeking out from behind the new president. Zelensky's television show, the one where he'd posed as a Ukrainian president, appeared on a Ukrainian television channel that happened to be part of a series of oligarchic holdings. The channel that hosted Zelensky's show, that paid his bills, that reached his audiences, that launched Zelensky directly into the presidency, was owned by none other than Kolomoisky. And maybe it was time for Kolomoisky to capitalize on that relationship with this new doe-eyed president. Zelensky never denied the fact that Kolomoisky owned the channel on which the youthful new president had appeared, or that the two had been, by all indications, close. But the new president could read the electorate. We must do everything we can so that the previous owners of Privatbank do not get a single kopeck, Zelensky announced, singling out his former patron. It's impossible to influence me. Neither Kolomoisky nor any other oligarch, no one will influence me. Zelensky had put his foot down. Kolomoisky would have no sway over his new administration. The oligarch quickly put the president's claims to the test. In 2019, shortly after Zelensky's election, Kolomoisky returned to Ukraine. He apparently felt comfortable enough to oversee his legal fight from the belly of Kiev, showing Ukrainians and the country's Western financial backers in the IMF and in Washington that he wouldn't be cowed, not by investigators, and certainly not by a president he helped launch to power. If I put on glasses and look at myself like the whole rest of the world, I see myself as a monster, as a puppet master, as the master of Zelensky, someone making apocalyptic plans, Kolomoisky leered. I can start making this real. He'd become, as one later analyst said, a man in a class of his own, a super oligarch, dedicated to making his will known to both the new president and the rest of Ukraine alike. But early indications backed up Zelensky's claims of independence from his former backer. Zelensky held his ground. A year into the new president's administration, Ukraine's parliament pushed through legislation that formally blocked the oligarch from ever regaining control of Privatbank, known, memorably enough, as the Anti-Kolomoisky Law. Politically, it will mean in the eyes of the general public and political elites that he has lost control over Zelensky, which is a real blow. Tatyana Shevchuk, who works as a lawyer with the country's Anti-Corruption Action Center, said. And Shevchuk was right. Suddenly, Kolomoisky's path back to his assets and to his power base appeared stunted, closed on all fronts. Despite his return, his standing in Ukraine had collapsed. His legal bills piled up in Ukraine and the U.S. and elsewhere, and the new president hardly appeared to be in his pocket. For the sinking oligarch, though, Kolomoisky had one card left up his sleeve, a trump card, fittingly enough, still left to play. And by early 2020, Kolomoisky saw his chance. While Trump decimated America's anti-corruption platform, his administration immediately bogged down elsewhere, stalked by claims of Russian collusion and interference during the 2016 campaign. Secret meetings with Kremlin attaches, back-channel promises to lift sanctions, foreknowledge about hacked material and amplification of fake Facebook pages and fake Twitter feeds and fake Instagram accounts. All of it caught up to Trump almost from the outset of his presidency. When the U.S. Department of Justice tapped special counsel Robert Mueller to investigate the Trump campaign's links with Russia and post-Soviet oligarchs, America clung on for a ride into the heart of Russian interference operations and what the American president knew about it all. As Americans waited for the results of Mueller's inquiry, information began leaking that illustrated how the tears in America's anti-kleptocracy fabric had only continued to widen. The leaks and investigative reports pointed to the fact that post-Soviet officials and oligarchs had discovered a pair of new loopholes to exploit and new tools to implement, creating a new pipeline that led them directly into the White House and directly into the control center of America's anti-corruption efforts and American democracy itself. <laughs>
The first loophole dealt with an industry that had exploded in importance and net worth over the past decade, hedge funds and private equity. These private investment funds, which target a range of assets and which bring in investors with far deeper pockets than most, were initially roped into the Patriot Act's anti-money laundering requirements. But because these investment vehicles at the time were relatively small, restricted to things like pension funds and high net worth individuals, the Treasury Department decided to do what it did with the real estate industry. They offered the hedge funds and private equity firms a temporary exemption from such regulations. Again, there's no evidence any of this was malign. Treasury's rationale here was the same as with the real estate sector. It wanted to study how regulations could affect this growing pillar of the American financial sector. But, as with all the other exemptions, by the start of the 2020s, that temporary exemption was nearly 20 years old, during which time the hedge fund and private equity industry had mushroomed into one of the biggest and least regulated financial sectors extant. The entire industry is now an ocean of anonymous wealth, sucking up trillions of dollars from around the world. And in the U.S., private equity and hedge funds can do so with no obligation to check the sources of client wealth or even figure out who they're offering their anonymous financial services to. These funds are doing the same thing as the Swiss banks, anonymizing money on an industrial scale, wrote investigative journalist Tom Burgess. Already, we've seen substantial sums from Chinese, Russian, and Saudi sources circling among these private, unregulated investment firms. One Wall Street Journal investigation, for instance, found that the Saudi government has been the largest Silicon Valley startup funder since mid-2016, investing at least $11 billion. But thanks to the Treasury Department's temporary exemption, Bloomberg wrote, the U.S. knows shockingly little about the sources of foreign finance flowing through hedge funds and private equity, or about just how much of those industries is propped up by dirty money. With no requirement to disclose even the names of investors or non-voting owners, private equity firms are perfect vehicles for money laundering, anti-corruption expert Sarah Chase wrote in 2020. Private equity funds can shield the identities of all but a very few owners, so they are magnets for questionable money. Added Joshua Kirschenbaum, a former Treasury official who's tried to raise the alarm about the threats these investment vehicles now pose to broader anti-cliptocracy efforts, these funds are among the most sophisticated investors and an appealing vehicle for a foreign actor with malign intent. For example, one seeking to interfere in an election, cultivate inappropriate political influence, or engage in complex financial crime. In short, hedge funds and private equity are the latest tools for hiding gobs of illicit wealth available to anyone looking for a safe haven for their dirty money. The industry's defense, according to those lobbying on its behalf, is that because such funds are largely restricted to deep-pocketed entrepreneurs and because a multi-year commitment is required before investors can pull their money out, these funds are hardly successful money laundering lures. They essentially ask, if you're trying to launder money, why would you bury it somewhere you can't access for years on end? And there's a decent point buried in that spin. If you're looking for a quick laundering turnaround, these funds are the last place you want to look. Yet that completely misunderstands the appeal of hedge funds and private equity in the first place. After all, the crooked oligarchs attracted to such funds aren't looking for quick laundering turnarounds. They're looking to keep their ill-gotten wealth safe as their kleptocratic nest egg. Billions in dirty money can go in with no questions asked, and all the oligarchs or officials have to do is wait a few years before they can pull the money out, money that's then perfectly clean. Think of it as someone grabbing the control knob of the American money laundering machine and turning it to the long cycle. If you're human trafficking or selling drugs or if it's a business you're running and you need to get that money back to get more meth or to buy more fentanyl or to pay more coyotes, that money's not going into a hedge fund. Alma Angadi, a former Treasury official who tried to implement anti-money laundering procedures for the industry, told me. But if you're an oligarch stealing oil money and you don't need all of it, you need to keep it somewhere safe. So you put it in a hedge fund or real estate. You want to protect it from your own government as much as ours. It's not a good vehicle for narco traffickers, but it's sure as hell a good vehicle if you're a corrupt public official. In 2020, a leak of internal FBI documents revealed the Bureau's ballooning concerns about the money laundering now swirling the industry. Foreign criminals, foreign oligarchs, and foreign adversaries 
have begun using hedge funds and private equity firms to launder money, circumventing traditional anti-money laundering programs, the FBI wrote. The Bureau pointed directly to the temporary exemption that allowed transnational money launderers to take advantage. The FBI assumes anti-money laundering programs are not adequately designed to monitor and detect threat actors' use of private investment funds to launder money, the FBI memo continued. Criminally complicit investment fund managers likely will expand their money laundering operations as private placement opportunities increase, resulting in continued infiltration of the licit global financial system. The FBI cited a number of examples of recent infiltration into this sector, with the dirty money mixing and churning alongside things like American pension funds. In January 2019, a Mexican cartel opened a number of new accounts with an American hedge fund, laundering at least $1 million every week. In New York, a private equity firm opened its doors to $100 million in wire transfers from a Russian company connected to Russian organized crime. But it was in Maryland that post-Soviet interference efforts and money laundering via American hedge funds and private equity both came to a head. In 2013, an LLC called ByteGrid sealed a $7.5 million contract with the state in order to manage Maryland's election data, including the oversight of statewide voter registration information and election management systems. At the time, the deal raised no eyebrows. Russian interference in American elections was still a few years off, and few looked at foreign interference, let alone via private equity investments, as a potential concern. But in 2015, ByteGrid was acquired by a private equity company called Altpoint Capital Partners. Again, the move didn't seem to worry anyone. All anyone saw was a private equity firm purchasing a company specializing in computer systems, which just so happened to be overseeing the integrity of Maryland's elections and voter data. What no one in Maryland realized, what no one knew until Maryland officials received a call from the FBI, was that the principal investor in the private equity company wasn't a distant American investor or a pension fund looking for solid returns for its constituents. It was, instead, a Russian oligarch, one intimately close with Putin. Vladimir Potanin, a balding, sullen-faced billionaire, had stood as one of Russia's wealthiest oligarchs for years. Potanin gained notoriety as one of the brains behind the much-maligned privatization scandals of the mid-1990s which funneled much of Russia's natural resources and industrial treasures directly into oligarchs' pockets. As David Hoffman wrote in his seminal 2001 book on Russian oligarchs, Potanin became a ringleader of all the oligarchs in 1995 in their greatest single property grab, helping create a process that was not open to foreigners, was not transparent, and turned out to be rigged. It also had one profound consequence that they did not foresee. The privatization process was the beginning of a merger between the Russian oligarchs and the government. Officials in Maryland had likely never heard of Potanin, but this oligarch was now secretly bankrolling the private equity firm that oversaw the company tasked with maintaining the integrity, the authenticity, and the efficacy of elections in Maryland, including the election in 2016, in which America experienced a shockwave of foreign interference, the kind of which it had never before seen. As State Senate President Thomas V. Miller said when announcing the discovery, we felt it imperative that our constituents know that a Russian oligarch has purchased our election machinery. Fortunately, none of Maryland's 2016 votes appeared changed, and there's as yet no indication that Botanin used his anonymous investments to sway American policy. The same can't be said, however, of the financial flows from the roster of post-Soviet oligarchs connected to interference operations into a second and equally wide-open sector, American nonprofits. When you think of nonprofits, maybe you think of a local charity, or perhaps a group like Amnesty International, trying to better communities both near and far. But there's another class of American nonprofits that operates on a more elite, highbrow footing. Institutions like high-profile universities such as Harvard and the University of Southern California, cultural icons such as New York's Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, and the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., entities like prestigious think tanks that act as unofficial centers of policymaking, such as the Brookings Institution and the Council on Foreign Relations. These nonprofits enjoy rarefied status in the U.S., hosting dignitaries, working with legislators to help craft policy, acting as America's font of intellectual and cultural capital, 
and helping buttress American soft power. In many ways, these institutes and universities and cultural staples are the best of America. But like hedge funds, real estate, or escrow agents before them, they're also not subjected to any anti-money laundering or due diligence procedures. To be sure, money laundering via non-profits doesn't seem to make much sense. But these non-profits serve a different purpose for kleptocrats. Given the lack of any oversight or regulation, American non-profits have effectively left the door wide open for any kleptocrat who'd like to improve their image, to use their dirty money to launder not their money, but their reputations. The phenomenon is known as reputation laundering. An oligarch or a crooked official can offer their dirty money as a donation to these non-profits. The non-profits don't transform those funds into clean money, as with real estate or hedge funds. Rather, they transform the donor into a philanthropist or publish material whitewashing the donor's background, offering them a new, benevolent reputation that helps bury any rumors or suppositions about their corruption and helps dissuade others from looking too closely into their background. For years, there was little data to back up claims that these American nonprofits had transformed into reputation laundering centers. But as I and a number of anti-corruption colleagues, including those with the Anti-Corruption Data Collective, discovered in 2020, these institutes had not only become reputation laundering factories, but they'd become massive magnets for the same questionable foreign monies already warming through American shell companies, American hedge funds, American real estate, and the like. More concerningly, these nonprofits all gladly accepted tainted funds from the entire range of post-Soviet oligarchs directly connected to foreign interference efforts in the U.S. The numbers we uncovered were staggering. In one of our studies in 2020, we found that donations from the Russian and Ukrainian oligarchs connected to interference investigations totaled anywhere between $372 million and $435 million, all directed to more than 200 of the most prestigious nonprofit institutions in America. Universities like George Washington and Cornell and NYU. Cultural institutes like the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Guggenheim. Think tanks like the Atlantic Council and the Council on Foreign Relations. All of them recipients of substantial sums from the oligarchs directly connected to foreign interference operations, including some later sanctioned directly by the U.S. for their role in Russia's efforts. Any number of oligarchs have pursued this tactic. Russian oligarch Viktor Vexelberg, who was sanctioned in 2018 by the U.S. for aiding the Kremlin's efforts and Russia's dictatorship, donated substantial amounts to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, a prominent think tank in Washington. The Wilson Center awarded Vexelberg the Woodrow Wilson Award for Public Service for his outstanding contributions to the rebirth of Russian philanthropy. Another oligarch, Viktor Pinchuk, who had previously bankrolled Paul Manafort's work, according to DOJ filings, though the oligarch later denied it, used his Ukraine-based foundation to donate significant sums to prestigious think tanks like the Atlantic Council and Brookings Institution. The Ukrainian oligarch even donated a staggering 10 to $25 million to the Clinton Foundation, including individual gifts of $1 to $5 million in 2012 and between $5 and $10 million in 2013. All of these donations have helped Pinchuk to be seen as a pro-Western figure, escaping the kinds of criticism some of his other oligarchic compatriots have faced. But these figures are nothing compared to a post-Soviet oligarch named Lynn Blavatnik. Despite being worth an estimated tens of billions of dollars, odds are you haven't heard of Blavatnik. However, he's arguably the most successful oligarch to emerge from the entire post-Soviet morass not least because he managed to obtain American citizenship. Blavatnik made billions in the Russian natural resources industry, working directly alongside a number of now-sanctioned oligarchs like Vexelberg and Oleg Deripaska. After obtaining American citizenship, Blavatnik made his splashiest investment in 2011 when he snapped up Warner Music for $3.3 billion. Still, Blavatnik's hold in the U.S. remained somewhat precarious, as The Hollywood Reporter revealed, the sources of Blavatnik's wealth aren't entirely clear. As such, Blavatnik turned to a familiar playbook, philanthropy. Donations soon burst forth, either from the oligarch or his company, Access Industries, 
to dozens of American institutes willing to open their doors for him, willing to transform him from a post-Soviet oligarch with an unclear background into a benefactor par excellence. There were the universities, including NYU and USC and Sarah Lawrence, all of which accepted his money. There were the cultural institutions, like New York's Lincoln Center and Carnegie Hall, the latter of which now counts Blavatnik as a trustee. In 2018, Blavatnik outdid himself. His Blavatnik Family Foundation announced a $200 million donation to Harvard Medical School, the largest gift in the school's entire history. Administrators will rename the school's 10 academic departments located on its main campus, the Blavatnik Institute at Harvard Medical School, the Harvard Crimson reported. People forgot all about Blavatnik's background, or about his previous work alongside now-sanctioned Russian oligarchs, and began viewing him simply as a philanthropist. For a bit, Blavatnik appeared able to toss his money around wherever he liked. But in 2019, news broke that special counsel Robert Mueller's office had specifically investigated Blavatnik's massive donations to Trump's inauguration. Vexelberg, one of the Russian oligarchs sanctioned by the U.S., also claimed that he attended Trump's inauguration party at a table Blavatnik paid for. Blavatnik's spokesperson denied this. Shortly thereafter, with his reputation taking a significant hit, Blavatnik announced a $13 million donation to the Council on Foreign Relations, heretofore considered one of America's more prestigious think tanks, a move that appeared to directly follow the reputation laundering playbook mentioned above. Unlike his previous donations, though, Blavatnik's latest gift was instantly met by a chorus of criticism from the most prominent anti-corruption and anti-kleptocracy voices in the U.S. and elsewhere. In a letter addressed to CFR head Richard Haas, dozens of signatories, including leading experts on post-Soviet kleptocracy and former members of the Treasury Department, State Department, and National Security Council, condemned the CFR's willingness to accept the donation, claiming it was a means of helping Blavatnik export Russian kleptocratic practices to the West. As their letter read, We regard the donation as another step in the long-standing effort of Mr. Blavatnik, who, as we explained below, has close ties to the Kremlin and its kleptocratic network to launder his image in the West. It is our considered view that Blavatnik uses his philanthropy, funds obtained by and with the consent of the Kremlin, at the expense of the state budget and the Russian people, at leading Western academic and cultural institutions to advance his access to political circles. Such philanthropic capital enables the infiltration of the U.S. and U.K. political and economic establishments at the highest levels, it is also a means by which Blavatnik exports Russian kleptocratic practices to the West. Others published similar criticisms. Blavatnik is entitled to spend his money how he pleases, Anne Marlowe wrote in the New York Times, but institutions, which at least in principle stand for the ethical pursuit of knowledge, sully themselves by accepting it. One of the few groups to return Blavatnik's attempted donation was the Hudson Institute, Haas claimed the CFR undertook a rigorous review of the funds, as it does with all donations. But Haas stated that the think tank would still be keeping the money nonetheless. Not only that, but Haas proudly announced that the CFR would be renaming their internship program after Blavatnik, and who, after all, could be against financing underpaid interns. Blavatnik's successful CFR donation illustrated that it's frankly open season. Chase, one of the letter's signatory, told me. It broadcasts to the Kremlin that if you just disguise your money a little bit, the U.S. system is still fully penetrable. It's that penetrability that brings us directly back to Trump and to the final marriage of American kleptocracy, American power, and the potential end of American democracy. In 2014, prompted by a request from the FBI, Austrian authorities arrested a Ukrainian oligarch named Dmitry Firtash, holding him while he awaited extradition to the U.S., at the time, the arrest sent shudders throughout the oligarchic class, both in Ukraine and beyond. Long viewed as one of the titans of the post-Soviet gas trade, and long associated with the kinds of corrupt, kleptocratic money-moving schemes others like Kolomoisky knew so well, Firtash dodged accusations of high-level corruption by playing the same reputation-laundering games others had long pursued, including wooing former members of the British Parliament and donating millions of pounds to Cambridge University in order to bankroll the university's Ukrainian studies program. As Cambridge still boasts on its website, 
Cambridge Ukrainian Studies, an initiative of the Department of Slavonic Studies, was launched at Cambridge with the support of Mr. Furtash in 2008. But by the mid-2010s, Furtash's schemes caught up with him. After the oligarch revealed his ties to Russian mafioso Semyon Mogilevich to an American diplomat, the U.S. Department of Justice accused the oligarch of acting as an upper echelon associate of Russian organized crime. Levying charges of large-scale bribery, the U.S. formally indicted him in 2014. Austrian authorities obliged and placed the stunned oligarch under house arrest. For a few years, Furtash wilted in Vienna. One figure seemed to capture the oligarch's ire more than any other. Joe Biden, then serving as vice president and the U.S.'s point man on pushing anti-corruption reforms in Ukraine. I was repulsed by Biden's presence in Ukraine, the oligarch would later say, blaming Biden for the successful pro-transparency reforms Ukraine instituted following the 2014 revolution. He was the overlord. Toward the end of the 2010s, however, Furtash still hadn't flown to the U.S., and still hadn't been forced to face the charges the DOJ had leveled against him. And by then, a new administration was running the show in Washington. A new administration dismantling America's anti-kleptocracy policies, one decision at a time. A new administration launched into the White House by one of Furtash's old business partners, Paul Manafort, whom Furtash had worked with during Manafort's time in Ukraine. A new administration that, via a network of far-right lawyers and frumpy, cartoonish bagmen, had begun rummaging around for dirt on the figure Trump thought posed the greatest threat to his 2020 campaign, Biden. It was a new administration that, as Furtash saw it, presented an opportunity. In 2019, Furtash dumped his previous legal team, composed of white-collar Washington insiders. He replaced them with a pair of conspiratorial, hard-right lawyers named Victoria Tensing and Joe DeGeneva. He also hired someone he described as a translator, a dowdy Ukrainian-American named Lev Parnas, who claimed to know both Trump and Trump's befuddled lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. In addition to the money he used to pay Tensing and DeGeneva, Furtash shelled out hundreds of thousands of dollars directly to Parnas, including funds for private jets and trips to Vienna, transforming Parnas into, as he said, the best-paid interpreter in the world. Shortly after Furtash hired the triumvirate, Americans began learning all about how dirty, post-Soviet money had upended American politics. They learned about Trump's attempts to shake down the Ukrainian government for dirt on Biden, the first time a president had ever strong-armed a foreign government in order to fabricate smears against a political rival. Americans also began learning about all of Giuliani's unregistered work on behalf of shady foreign clients, from Ukraine to Venezuela to Turkey and his ties to a raft of disgraced Ukrainian officials suddenly spinning lies about Biden's work. Americans further learned that Parnas had secretly funneled suspect post-Soviet monies into the U.S. via an anonymous Delaware shell company, part of the hundreds of millions of dollars Moscow and Beijing have expended to interfere in democratic processes abroad, as the German Marshall Fund's Josh Rudolph and Thomas Morley uncovered in 2020. At the center of all these revelations stood one figure, Furtash, the Ukrainian kleptocrat, whispering in the ears of the pro-Trump figures he'd surrounded himself with, bankrolling their efforts, serving as the apparent broker between Giuliani's team and those in Ukraine trying to help Trump's shakedown, acting as a black hole of dirty money around which all the efforts spun. Giuliani's position on Furtash suddenly changed when the oligarch became useful to Giuliani, Ukrainian journalist Sergei Leshenko wrote. And now his friends are working for Furtash's lawyers, and Giuliani himself uses evidence created by Furtash in his plot to defend Trump. It wasn't difficult to see what Furtash wanted out of the entire affair. As Parnas later revealed, he'd told the oligarch that there were certain ways to get the American extradition request lifted, perhaps most importantly, helping Trump's broader efforts in Ukraine. Lo and behold, soon after he hired his new legal team, Furtash's pro-Trump lawyers received a sit-down with Attorney General Bill Barr to discuss their client's status, a remarkable development, given that Barr was supposed to be charged with overseeing Furtash's extradition. Thanks in large part to Trump's rank incompetence, the entire pressure campaign against Ukraine eventually imploded, resulting in Trump's first impeachment. But save for a concerned whistleblower, who revealed Trump's campaign and began the wheels of impeachment spinning, Furtash could have succeeded 
not only in getting the extradition request lifted, but in creating an entirely new mode of how kleptocrats can influence a susceptible, mercenary White House, directly upending American anti-corruption and anti-kleptocracy efforts in the process. The playbook Furtash created was simple. If you're a kleptocrat who ends up in trouble for money laundering related crimes, you should hire pro-administration figures and claim to have knowledge of dirt on a political opponent, regardless of the accuracy of the information. You should then pledge to trade information and set up meetings in return for the White House lifting American investigations and American charges. And if you succeed, you can promptly return to the world of transnational money laundering these oligarchs know well. It was something completely unprecedented in American history, and it nearly worked. Some call it strategic corruption, or the emergence of the strategic usage of corrupt actors to subvert democratic governments and democracy writ large. More colloquially, you can just name it after the kleptocrat who perfected it. Just call it the Furtash model. This model is now open and available to any kleptocrats facing American investigations, regardless of the scope of their crimes. Other kleptocrats facing American charges swiftly tried the same playbook, or at least pieces of it. Mikolaj Zloshevsky, a Ukrainian oligarch connected to the gas trade, allegedly offered Giuliani derogatory information on Trump's political opponents if Giuliani could help the oligarch curry favor with the Justice Department. Joe Lowe, the Malaysian kleptocrat who convinced Britney Spears to pretzel herself inside a birthday cake, and who ended up ironically bankrolling the production of The Wolf of Wall Street, a film about white-collar criminals with looted monies, secretly funneled money to GOP fundraiser Elliot Broidy in order to lobby Trump. But if there's one oligarch who embodied the Furtash model best, it was Kolomoisky effectively completing the loop of American kleptocracy writ large and bringing it all to its final, obvious conclusion. Hunkered in Kiev in early 2019, Kolomoisky had watched his hopes of wringing concessions out of Zelensky go up in smoke, and he sensed the walls closing in. By 2019, the FBI had learned where he had stashed his ill-gotten gains in the U.S., in places like Cleveland and Illinois and Kentucky. Meanwhile, Lawsuits filed against him in the U.S. and elsewhere continued to accumulate. The schlubby oligarch-turned-warlord flailed for a response, watching his windows of opportunity quickly closing. But Kolomoisky knew Furtash, and he watched the latter's maneuvers closely. He saw the fellow oligarch, also subjected to American investigations, hire a pair of lawyers firmly in Trump's camp and watched them get an extraordinary sit-down with the American Attorney General. He watched him toss millions at others in Trump's immediate orbit. He watched a spool of clearly fabricated stories about Biden suddenly spin out, cascading around the White House, with Furtash sitting at the middle of the entire operation, an oligarchic spider at the center of a web of lies and payments. And he watched, just like the rest of us, this new Furtash model play out in real time. And maybe, he thought, he could use it for his own ends. First, in November 2019... Kolomoisky hired one of Trump's longtime lawyers, Mark Kasowitz, a bulldog attorney who'd worked as part of Trump's team during the Mueller investigation. He also hired a second American lawyer, Bud Cummins, who'd pushed pro-Trump rhetoric regarding Ukraine before. Alongside these two, he reportedly hired a Ukrainian national named Andriy Teleshenko, who'd joined Furtash's lawyers in helping spread anti-Biden conspiracies among American right-wing propaganda outlets. Kolomoisky then dove headfirst into the fertile ground of conspiracy theories that the White House and its defenders had gleefully promulgated. When Giuliani visited Ukraine in December, scouring for more dirt on Biden, he met with an oafish former Ukrainian official named Kostyantin Kulik, a figure who just so happened to work at Kolomoisky's behest as the oligarch's secret weapon. Kulik claimed to have damaging information on Biden. Giuliani also had a sit-down meeting with Oleksandr Dubinsky, another malignant official who headed Kolomoisky's influence group in Kiev, according to one Ukrainian journalist. By late 2019, Kolomoisky spread the word. He had the dirt Trump wanted, and he didn't care how it got to the White House. The oligarch began claiming to have damaging information on the Bidens, Politico reported, including on both Joe and his son Hunter. As one attorney familiar with his efforts said, the oligarch used the promise of scandalous intel to keep himself relevant to the whole Biden-dirt discussion, and he would also like to ingratiate himself to Trump. The oligarch played coy, 
He didn't want to trumpet his Biden-related claims to the world, just to the president and his bagmen. He's been kind of cryptic and cute about it, the lawyer continued. But as one Western diplomat said, Kolomoisky was clearly trying to become friends with Trump and Giuliani. The signs, as with Firtash, were unmistakable. As Volodymyr Vysenko, a Kiev-based political analyst, told Talking Points Memo, Kolomoisky seems to be trying the same thing as Firtash. He was trying out the Firtash model, with an American administration more than willing to play along. And the oligarch had one demand. Make his issues, all these lawsuits and inquiries, go away. Kill the investigations in both the U.S. and Ukraine. And let the kleptocratic carousel continue, as it ever had. Our oligarchs think that if you befriend the main person in a country, then that will solve all your problems, Fisenko continued. With a president like Trump, what oligarch would think otherwise? By 2020, Kolomoisky had become the logical end point for America's collapse into the global center of modern kleptocracy. He was a man who spent years taking full advantage of American anti-money laundering loopholes, allegedly piling untold millions into American real estate with little more than a desire to obscure his jaw-dropping dirty money operations. And now, as investigators began uncovering his network, he turned to an American president to get his investigations and his charges lifted with the promise of unfounded dirt against a political rival in return. Through Kolomoisky, the marriage of kleptocracy and foreign interference in the era of Trump had been consummated. But the oligarch misjudged the timing. By the time he'd started using this Firtash model for his own ends, it was already too late. Too many others were already on the hunt for other kleptocrats trying the same strategy. And America, despite Trump's best efforts otherwise, remained a functioning democracy, with pressure from Congress and the broader body politic keeping the heat on the administration. There were too many eyeballs watching what Giuliani and his cronies were doing on the president's behalf. Kolomoisky's efforts, like Firtash's before him, eventually splintered, undone by American democracy. But he, like Firtash, nearly succeeded. And if he had, that American kleptocratic circle of using American financial anonymity to hide gargantuan money laundering operations and then using the proceeds of such operations to convince an American president to end any investigations and lift any charges, allowing the money laundering operations to run on in perpetuity, would have stood complete. The oligarchs, those who'd looked to the U.S. for years for their dirty money needs, would have won. Chapter 17 American Kleptocracies There are but two parties now, traitors and patriots, and I want hereafter to be ranked with the latter. Ulysses S. Grant Trump's first impeachment saga in 2019 revealed a great deal, from smear campaigns and physical threats against American diplomats to Trump's use of American power for his own ends. None of it saved him from election loss in 2020 or from becoming the first president to ever be impeached multiple times, and none of it prevented Firtash from facing imminent extradition to the U.S., despite all of his efforts to forestall it. Nor did Kolomoisky's subterranean efforts to use the Firtash model for his own ends succeed either. Once Firtash's efforts crumpled, the heat of the impeachment investigations became too much for the other oligarchs following suit. By mid-2020, with everyone in Washington looking out for foreign oligarchs whispering in the ears of pro-Trump lackeys, Kolomoisky's path to the American president effectively disappeared, and it couldn't have come at a worse time. Because in August 2020, U.S. authorities showed their cards. Not only had they begun a formal investigation into Kolomoisky's American assets, but they'd already uncovered enough information to issue formal asset seizures against a number of Kolomoisky's and the Optima family's American holdings. With footage of FBI agents ransacking Optima's Cleveland offices, Kolomoisky was now on the receiving end of a tactic he'd so often employed against his opponents in Ukraine. Over the course of more than a decade, one of the DOJ complaints against the oligarch read, Kolomoisky and his partner Bogolyubov used Privatbank to steal billions of dollars of the bank's funds. Backing up investigators in Ukraine, DOJ officials added that the magnitude of Kolomoisky's fraud and theft was so great that the National Bank of Ukraine was forced to bail out the bank by providing $5.5 billion in order to stave off economic crisis for the whole country. All of the details of Kolomoisky, Shokit, and Korf's efforts were there, 
laid bare in the allegations by American officials. Kolomoisky and his cronies spent prolifically. They purchased more than 5 million square feet of commercial real estate in Ohio, steel plants in Kentucky, West Virginia, and Michigan, a cell phone manufacturing plant in Illinois, and commercial real estate in Texas. All that Ukrainian investigators had alleged, all that Gontareva, who'd faced down death threats and arson attacks and hit and runs, already knew, was there, in black and white, with the imprimatur of the U.S. Department of Justice. And it came with the full backing of the DOJ's Kleptocracy Asset Recovery Initiative, which celebrated its 10-year anniversary by targeting the man who'd allegedly turned swaths of the American Rust Belt into his personal money-laundering fiefdoms. By the end of Trump's term in office, Kolomoisky stood adrift. The path to Trump's ear had been blocked. The oligarch's American assets were suddenly frozen, his network exposed. Legislation in Kiev specifically forbade him from ever returning to control of Privatbank. Kolomoisky looked around and appeared lonelier than ever before. Hemmed in by Ukrainian and American investigations, Kolomoisky had transformed from titan of Ukraine's oligarchy to instead a cautionary tale. And in early 2021, the Americans wielded their hammer. In a public statement, Washington revealed that it was directly sanctioning Kolomoisky and his family. As U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said, the sanctions stemmed specifically from Kolomoisky's involvement in significant corruption, with the oligarch leading ongoing efforts to undermine Ukraine's democratic processes and institutions. If anyone missed the move, the U.S. Embassy in Kiev tweeted out a photo of Kolomoisky with a giant red stamp that read, in all caps, designated for involvement in significant corruption. The reason for the U.S.'s moves to sanction Kolomoisky was simple enough. A few months earlier, a new administration had taken the reins in Washington. A new presidency, pledged to restoring American stewardship and American stability, and to centering anti-corruption and anti-kleptocracy at the heart of a new American chapter. This book is hardly an exaltation of Joe Biden, or a defense of Biden's previous record. Given Biden's years of working as a senator from Delaware, such a defense would hardly be full-throated. Rather, Biden's rise to the presidency, unexpected as it was, points to the president's role as a vessel for broader anti-corruption and counter-kleptocracy reform, and the swelling awareness of a new generation of American policymakers of the intersection of American kleptocracy and national security, electoral legitimacy, and the global tide of authoritarianism. The new president didn't wait long after the 2020 election to center anti-corruption as a primary plank of his administration. As he laid out in a piece in Foreign Affairs immediately following his victory, Biden said he would specifically single out corruption as a core policy throughline for his administration, issuing a presidential policy directive that establishes combating corruption as a core national security interest. To that end, he announced he would specifically target illicit tax havens and expand American efforts to go after stolen and laundered assets. Structurally, Biden pronounced that he'd also usher in a new federal agency, the Commission on Federal Ethics, which would not only ensure vigorous and unified enforcement of anti-corruption laws, but would further be empowered to issue and enforce subpoenas and refer matters for criminal investigation to the DOJ. Internationally, Biden has singled out weaponized corruption, the kind that allows kleptocratic regimes to entrench and expand and enhance malign efforts abroad as a non-traditional threat, one that NATO member states must focus on combating. We will take special aim at confronting corruption, which rots democracy from the inside and is increasingly weaponized by authoritarian states to undermine democratic institutions, Biden's White House announced in early 2021. On their own, the pledges represented the most consequential support for a new anti-corruption and counter-kleptocracy push that America had ever seen, or at least since the days of Carl Levin and his efforts to get anti-money laundering language into the Patriot Act. But Biden's comments hardly existed in a vacuum. Instead, they rose to the top of a chorus that was already growing louder by the day, building upon a nascent movement to reclaim American anti-corruption and counter-kleptocracy leadership writ large, a movement that, by early 2021, had seen more energy, more excitement, and more momentum than any moment in American history. Because even before Biden swore his oath and entered the White House, Congress was already taking a momentous step toward ending America's role as the center of global kleptocracy. On the first day of 2021, the National Defense Authorization Act of 2020, NDAA, became law.
Generally, the passage of the annual bill is a rote affair, shoring up American defense expenditures and offering pork barrel projects to assorted officials. This iteration, though, had one clause that stood out, one piece that made this one of the most consequential counter-kleptocracy bills ever passed. At long last, the U.S. would ban anonymous American shell companies. With the bill's passage, which overcame Trump's veto, Congress had finally, formally, forevermore, banned the formation of anonymous shells in the U.S. The anti-shell company language in the NDAA didn't generate many headlines, but it's difficult to overstate the importance of the bill or of the ban. While journalists and pundits paid attention to everything else in the final weeks of Trump's presidency, from insurrection to impeachment, American legislators, with significant bipartisan backing, had quietly taken a sledgehammer to the edifice of American kleptocracy. It is certainly the most significant anti-money laundering reform in 20 years, said Clark Gascoigne, who led the push by helping steer the Financial Accountability and Corporate Transparency FACT coalition, bringing support from across the political spectrum. And probably the most significant anti-corruption reform as well. To be sure, the ban hardly happened overnight. Previous efforts to eliminate anonymous shells went nowhere, flaming out against lobbying from states like Delaware and Nevada or from the Chamber of Commerce, or the American Bar Association, or from anyone who would see a bit less revenue if they had to stop selling or using anonymous shell companies to hide their dirty money racing through the U.S. Nor was the 2020 bill a panacea. While those setting up companies will now need to identify and report the beneficial owners of the LLCs, such ownership information remains accessible only to American officials, rather than to the public, journalists, or activists. But those issues can be ironed out in future bills, because even without a publicly accessible database, the fact that anonymous U.S. shell companies are no more is itself a substantial salvo from Washington against the bedrock of transnational money laundering. For the first time in nearly two decades, the U.S. had passed a remarkable piece of counter-kleptocracy legislation. And for the first time in years, perhaps ever, the foundations of America's kleptocratic networks buckled. You'd be forgiven for missing the news of America's elimination of shell companies, what with it coming during America's first insurrectionist presidential transition, its first non-peaceful transfer of power since Abraham Lincoln in 1860. But the fact that Trump's failed power grab overshadowed the landmark passage of anti-shell company legislation points to a broader reality of the American kleptocratic industrial complex. That is, even with the ouster of a would-be authoritarian like Trump, and with the passage of the new anti-shell company legislation, the fight to end the reign of American kleptocracy is hardly tied to a single event, or a single president, or to his removal. If anything, it's just the beginning. There are a few areas of obvious, low-hanging fruit on the counter-kleptocracy front moving forward. The one benefit of surveying the landscape of loopholes and financial secrecy mechanisms remaining in the U.S., there's an entire buffet of options for reformers. And no area merits more attention than the decades-long temporary exemptions enjoyed by industries rolling in trillions of dollars, much of it anonymous, much of it coming in dirty and leaving perfectly pristine, leaving those industries now standing as the remaining pillars of the American kleptocratic construct. The first of these industries is the one that seems to connect all the kleptocrats who race to America for their money laundering needs, including Teodoran, and Kolomoisky, and all the others mentioned in this book. Real estate. For real estate, the loophole was so huge you could fit a skyline through it, investigative journalist Tom Burgess once wrote. And he's not wrong. Thanks to the Patriot Act's temporary loophole, entire city skylines have been transformed into key ingredients in the American laundromat, including those in places no one ever expected, like Cleveland. We already know what the solution is. The end of anonymity the end of anonymous cash purchases, of anonymous shell purchases, of anonymous purchases made via American attorneys who hide the identities of their clients behind attorney-client privilege. Time and again, in skyscrapers and condos, in McMansions and steel mills, in tired factories and entire cities, that anonymity in American real estate has fired the motors of global kleptocracy. For decades, American real estate has provided anonymity for anyone who wants it for anyone looking to transform their dirty money into legitimate assets. It's a reality that has lined the pockets of the broader real estate industry 
and has had devastating effects on sagging downtowns and local communities in the U.S., and on entire nation-states abroad watching their treasuries and banks looted and laundered via American real estate. Thankfully, prior to Trump's ascension, the U.S. launched a pilot program aimed at fine-tuning the best methods of ending the all-encompassing anonymity in American real estate. Known as Geographic Targeting Orders, GTO, the program, first announced by the Obama administration in 2016, forced title insurers, those providing insurance to the owners of the property in question, to identify the real, beneficial owners of certain properties and purchases. As it was a pilot program, the GTO project only targeted a select few major American cities, including Seattle, New York, Miami, Honolulu, and a handful of others. The program was built on the same theory propounded above, that ending anonymity was the means to ending American kleptocracy and ending the real estate industry's role as both a benefactor and proponent on a scale few could imagine of transnational money laundering. Lo and behold, the theory proved true. Revealing the identities of those behind previously anonymous purchases lifted a veil on the owners and sent the dirty money searching for anonymity scampering elsewhere. One 2018 study found that anonymous shell company purchases declined drastically in the areas surveyed, even in places like Miami, still widely viewed as a city built on little more than money laundering. Even more remarkably, related housing prices dropped alongside by nearly 5%. It resulted in a bit less money lining luxury realtors' pockets, yes, but it was also the effective end of residential real estate in places like Miami as a sink of new dirty money flows. As an added bonus, it provided more affordable housing for the rest of us. All of which is to say, with anonymous American shell companies taken care of, the end of anonymity in the American real estate space must be the next major domino to fall. Whether that comes from the nationwide expansion of the GTO program or simply from the elimination of the skyline-wide temporary exemption for the real estate industry or some combination therein is up for legislators to decide. But the towers and factories and mills and mansions of anonymity must reveal their real, beneficial owners, regardless of their connections to Ukrainian warlords or African oligarchs or mafiosi the world over. It's also worth looking to solutions proven successful elsewhere such as the UK's Unexplained Wealth Orders program, which forces foreign officials to explain the sources of their wealth and face asset seizures if they can't. Once those identities are revealed, there should be increased consideration of things like a vacancy tax, specifically aimed at those who pocket these properties as little more than laundering vehicles, the likes of which we've already seen successfully implemented in places like the Canadian province of British Columbia. And why stop there? If anonymity remains the kleptocrat's asymmetric advantage, then transparency remains the best weapon in the counter-kleptocracy movement's arsenal. Such is the logic behind a thrust of similar proposals, such as the Global Asset Registry proposed by economist Gabriel Zuckman. In hedge funds and private equity, in the perpetual trusts of South Dakota, and among escrow agents across the country, in all those other areas that dodge the post-9-11 transparency and anti-money laundering requirements, the time for anonymity is over. FBI and Senate investigators, journalists and activists, national security voices and electoral security experts, we have all clamored for years about the need for the end of anonymity in these sectors, these favorite playgrounds of Russian oligarchs and corrupt Chinese kleptocrats and sanctioned Iranian officials, all those sectors that keep the engine of American kleptocracy running at full steam. As with the Shell Company legislation, the identities of those pouring billions into trusts and escrow accounts and hedge funds don't need to be made public, not initially at least, but their identities need to be made accessible to American law enforcement and to investigators from democratic governments elsewhere, including those struggling to their feet, like investigators in Kiev who uncover Ponzi schemes rattling entire populations. They should also be made known to other interested parties, the pension fund organizations, unwittingly mixing their finances with oligarchs' dirty money, the workers struggling to make a living at a mill secretly owned by a corrupt foreign official. The neighbors wondering why a row of nearby houses is always vacant, despite going for double the market value when they sold. All of this also goes for those in the art and auction market in the U.S. Despite claims from the industry that the American art and auction market remains untainted by malign actors, they maintain that the industry is just too niche or just too small to be of any interest,
the kleptocratic examples have only piled higher and higher. There's Theodoran, becoming the world's greatest collector of Michael Jackson memorabilia, courtesy of American anonymity. There's a pair of sanctioned Russian oligarchs, moving and laundering millions, gutting America's sanctions regime, courtesy of anonymity in the art market. There are God knows how many other examples, all turning to the greatest unregulated market in the entire world in order to hide their money. Given that many of these requirements for transparency are already on the books, applying such transparency is far from the uphill battle it may seem. Nor is that pre-existing language in things like the Patriot Act the only card the U.S. government can quickly play. In 2004, in a little-noticed measure at the height of the Iraq War, Congress granted the Treasury Department the right to create a cross-border payments database. For all the reasons detailed earlier, internal lethargy, lack of resources, industry-wide pushback, the database never came into existence. But that doesn't mean it can't yet be realized. As Joshua Kirschenbaum and David Murray wrote for the German Marshall Fund, U.S. banks process trillions of dollars of payments per day, including about half of cross-border funds transfers worldwide. A database highlighting and detailing these payments, which we already have in places like Canada and Australia, would not only help reduce regulatory burdens on banks, but would also stymie kleptocrats trying to bounce their funds in and out of American jurisdictions. And as a bonus, Kirschenbaum and Murray add, technology would make an international payments database straightforward and cost-effective. The only thing better than combating kleptocracy? Saving money while you're doing it. Not all of this requires legislation, per se. For the American nonprofits we saw in the previous chapter, sucking up hundreds of millions from questionable sources, new guidelines and best practices must be implemented, with an emphasis on public disclosures of all donor information. And for American lawyers, long able to cloak their work for kleptocrats behind attorney-client privilege, a new slate of legal ethics rules must be implemented. All lawyers creating corporate entities and trusts or helping purchase real estate and luxury yachts should be required to flag suspicious transactions and face significant punishment if they're found knowingly aiding these kleptocratic networks. Legislation isn't immediately needed on these fronts, but if these industries continue to refuse reform, if, as a foreign policy headline read, U.S. lawyers remain foreign kleptocrats' best friends, they're only asking for legislators to take another look. Of course, even with the end of all this anonymity, this still wouldn't be enough. Asset seizure should continue, and even be expanded. But seizing these assets isn't a viable solution in and of itself, as only a tiny percentage of holdings tied to dirty money is ever frozen, let alone returned to the population suffering at the hands of the kleptocrats in question. Likewise, legislation and new requirements are only as effective as their enforcement, and if regulatory bodies remain understaffed and under-resourced, the new legislation and pro-transparency moves are worth little more than the paper on which they're written. Few things have illustrated this dynamic more clearly than the so-called FinCEN files of 2020, which saw a tranche of Treasury Department documents detailing trillions of dollars in bank transactions spill into the open. The leaks raised fresh questions about the efficacy of even the basics of America's counter-kleptocracy push, illustrating how overwhelmed the Treasury Department's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, is when it comes to dealing with suspicious transactions flowing through American banks. As the documents detailed, numerous banks only took pro forma steps toward complying with the U.S.'s stringent anti-money laundering requirements in the banking sector. Some didn't even bother to file required paperwork on certain accounts until years after the suspicious transactions took place, despite increased regulations surrounding things like identifying those behind shell company accounts. The reason for such lethargy was simple. FinCEN, which was established in 1990 and oversees much of the anti-money laundering apparatus for banks, remained severely understaffed, scrounging for funding and employees. While the rate of banks' suspicious activity report, SAR, filings has doubled in the last decade, more and more bankers at least seem willing to flag potentially kleptocratic customers, total FinCEN staff has shrunk by some 10%. FinCEN could barely keep up, let alone try to enforce any infractions. Small wonder that, as one source familiar with the document said, most SARs are never even read, let alone acted upon. Such staffing woes aren't limited to FinCEN, though. The IRS has likewise been effectively gutted, allowing America to bleed tax receipts 
and allowing the wealthiest among us to tuck their billions away without any worry about the taxman knocking. Not only has the IRS's overall budget decreased over 20%, adjusted for inflation in recent years, but, at last check, the IRS had fewer auditors at the start of the 2020s than at any point since the 1950s. Small wonder that white-collar criminals, American or not, feel little fear about potential reprisals from the U.S. government. Staffing up, then, is a must for counter-kleptocracy reforms. It's also a relatively easy turnaround for the U.S. For inspiration, all American authorities need to do is look at how the Department of Justice has recently treated the scourge of unreported foreign lobbying. For decades, the DOJ's Foreign Agents Registration Act, FARA, was an effective backwater. Enacted in 1938 as a means of unveiling Nazi lobbyists, sparked in large part by the secret work of Ivy Lee, the so-called father of modern PR on behalf of Hitler's regime, FARA requires all those lobbying for foreign governments and their proxies to reveal their ties and how much they're making along the way. Yet for years, FARA itself remained little enforced and largely forgotten, with only a scattering of convictions over nearly eight decades. It wasn't quite a dead letter, but it was close. And then, in 2016, the U.S. watched a whole range of foreign forces wheedle their way into Trump's campaign, with corrupt figures out of both Russia and Ukraine linking up with numerous Americans in Trump's orbit. People like disgraced former National Security Advisor Mike Flynn, people like former Deputy Campaign Manager Rick Gates, and people like the avatar of foreign lobbying itself, Paul Manafort. After the details of Manafort's foreign work began spilling out in 2016, Farah had a new lease on life, and more momentum than at any point since its inception. Suddenly, the DOJ devoted new resources and new personnel toward enforcing FARA registrations and to making sure foreign lobbyists had to reveal the foreign forces lining their pockets. Registrations promptly skyrocketed, a new team at DOJ beefed up compliance, and Americans gained an unprecedented insight into the machinations of foreign lobbying in the U.S. Paradoxically, thanks to Trump and Manafort, FARA ended up funded and enforced to a greater extent than it had ever been during its previous eight decades of existence. Finally, decades after Lee and the Nazis connived to secretly sway unsuspecting Americans, Farah lived up to its promise, which just so happened to jail a number of pro-Trump figures, none of whom had disclosed their foreign work previously. Ending Anonymity Requiring Greater Disclosures Staffing Up Enforcement and Regulatory Agencies these are all relatively disparate, diffuse efforts, but they can be, have to be, part of a broader portfolio of action, of a whole-of-arsenal and whole-of-government approach. If all this seems daunting, that's understandable. It is. But this call to drive a stake through the heart of American kleptocracy has a historic precedent, one, fittingly enough, found in the period that most closely resembles the American political moment at the end of the Trump era the Gilded Age, during the end of the 19th century. The America of the Gilded Age stood saturated in wealth inequality, in rampaging monopolies, in the kinds of bribes and payoffs and endemic corruption most today would associate with the developing world. The height of the original Gilded Age revealed American capitalism in all its inhumanity and in all its corruption, much as the Trumpian Age has revealed all that is crass, all that is corrupt about the American political system and about modern capitalism more broadly. And yet, just a few years after its height, the ravages of the Gilded Age, as well as its attendant corruption, had been largely tamed. Not entirely, of course. Corruption never truly dies. But broadly, impressively, and unexpectedly. By the second decade of the 20th century, most of the excesses, patronage systems, greased palms, officials reliant on pay-for-play schemes across the country, had clearly been tackled. And that process of unwinding endemic American corruption points to the kind of multifaceted approach that will work for those of us now staring down this second Gilded Age. Those anti-corruption reforms of the late 19th and early 20th centuries didn't happen overnight. They took years and a combination of factors, including expanded oversight, significant investigations, increased government regulations, and even select high-profile prosecutions. Civil service reform which prioritized merit over patronage in government hiring, helped stanch corrupt networks at the federal level. Federal prosecutions of those paying and receiving bribes 
creating a new era of criminal enforcement, as one scholar said, launched new pro-transparency efforts across the U.S. Combined with new anti-corruption legislation, increased election finance transparency, pro-transparency reforms in the lobbying sector, and beefed-up regulatory oversight bodies, the U.S. lurched from the bog of the Gilded Age into a more equitable and more transparent time, one that we now know as the Progressive Era. Toward the end of the 2010s, the calls for a new Progressive Era became impossible to miss. In the U.S., the calls manifested themselves in a revitalized left, fired by the presidential campaigns of Senator Bernie Sanders and a new roster of congressional leaders. While Sanders' campaigns eventually flamed out, his imprint on broader policy will long outlast him. An entire slate of policy proposals, all centered on rising wealth and income inequality, have glommed on to American political discourse and have proved impossible to dislodge. Things like a wealth tax, which would target substantial holdings of the richest among us. Things like a return to a progressive taxation policy, such as the kind America boasted during the post-World War II period and which disintegrated amid broader deregulatory reforms. Things like bills specifically targeting the marriage between illicit finance, oligarchy, and the decline of democracy more broadly. Around the world, we have witnessed the rise of demagogues who, once in power, use their positions to loot the state of its resources, Sanders said in 2017, adding a year later that, we need to understand that the struggle for democracy is bound up with the struggle against kleptocracy and corruption. If nothing else, Sanders, alongside politicos like Senator Elizabeth Warren, has clarified the relationship between kleptocracy and runaway, unregulated capitalism in a way few have. Because at the end of the day, kleptocracy can be understood in many ways as capitalism at its rawest, or as capitalism at its worst. Capitalism unburdened by requirements for transparency or disclosure. Capitalism in which wealth can open any door needed without any safeguard in place. Capitalism in which brutal ruling classes, as we've seen in Russia and Kazakhstan, in China and Venezuela, in Equatorial Guinea and pre-revolution Ukraine, capture the levers of state power and all the wealth that comes with it to entrench their regimes forevermore and to kill off any democratizing efforts along the way and a capitalism that allows those regimes to turn to the U.S. whenever they need to take advantage of American financial secrecy, keeping their looted wealth safe and secure, and maybe, as Trump illustrated, even using it to help place a man servicing their kleptocratic needs directly in the White House. But if we're to enter a new progressive era, one to undo the devastation of this American kleptocracy, there's one other lesson to heed from a more recent point in American history. As Carl Levin and his staff highlighted during the passage of the post-9-11 reforms, none of the success they found would have been possible if the legislation hadn't already been ready. If legislators hadn't already crafted detailed plans to block off American financial institutions from dirty money, the small window of opportunity following the September 11 attacks would have shut, with little to show for it. If legislators hadn't been ready, American banks, those original progenitors of American kleptocracy, would have continued working with whomever they wanted, however they wanted, cycling billions and billions in dirty money. Instead, because Levin and his staff were prepared, America showed how an entire banking sector could be cleaned up and could shine a path forward for others, all because legislators like Levin were ready. Levin retired in 2015, but a new crop of counter-kleptocracy activists has emerged in Washington working with civil society and legislators to craft bills that can tackle these financial secrecy industries and restore the U.S.'s leadership status in the world of anti-corruption efforts. In the civil society sector, groups like Transparency International, Global Witness, the FACT Coalition, and the Hudson Institute's Kleptocracy Initiative, the latter, where I'm an adjunct fellow, led by new thinkers like Nate Sibley, have collated all these kleptocratic issues into a comprehensive structure and comprehensive story bundling recommendations to both legislators and experts alike. Helped along by investigative journalists at places like the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, ICIJ, and the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, OCCRP, these groups have all assisted in fleshing out our understanding of modern kleptocracy, as well as how to combat it. And in Congress, the Helsinki Commission, an independent, bipartisan federal commission focused on human rights and pro-democracy policies, 
has become the unofficial home for the counterkleptocracy brain trust. Led by policy analyst Paul Massaro, himself a font of bottomless pro-democracy energy, the Helsinki Commission has launched bill after bill to begin patching up America's counterkleptocracy regime. Massaro, alongside legislators like Rhode Island Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, has picked up the baton from Levin in Washington and has joined with Sibley and others, including luminaries and anti-corruption forces like Ben Judah, Elise Bean, Josh Rudolph, Abigail Bellows, Clark Gascoigne, and Jody Vittori, among plenty more, to usher in a new guard of counterkleptocracy efforts in the U.S., bridging partisan gaps and stitching together policy proposals that have gained widening audiences on both sides of the political aisle. Indeed, it's that bipartisan nature of the new counterkleptocracy cohort that presents perhaps the greatest reason for hopes of reform. The bill to ban anonymous shell companies, for instance, came with numerous co-sponsors, from arch-conservative voices like Senator Tom Cotton to Democratic stalwarts like Senator Bob Menendez, threading liberal and conservative supporters alike. Not that bipartisan support should necessarily be that surprising. After all, Levin enjoyed bipartisan support for his anti-money laundering thrusts at the PSI. And legislators across the political spectrum have all seen how their constituents have suffered as the tentacles of these offshoring networks have reached into communities, crept into industries, and upended and uprooted everything from national security to American elections themselves. These counterkleptocracy policies can and should be a bipartisan endeavor. Because while progressive, pro-transparency legislation is demanded on this front, the policies detailed earlier would also present a restoration of American leadership on the global stage and an extension of historic American leadership in the anti-corruption space. From the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, FCPA, to Levin's banking regulations, from creating FARA to cracking open the Swiss banking sector, the U.S. had claimed the torch of anti-corruption leadership for decades. Trump may have tried to snuff it out, but the flame burns still. And it's clear that without American leadership, the efforts to end the broader world of offshoring, or of transnational money laundering, or of rising oligarchies and oligopolies, both foreign and domestic, will ultimately fail. And without these much-needed efforts, there is little hope for the broader, liberal democratic projects around the world. Because the thing that ties all the modern anti-American, anti-democratic regimes and movements together around the globe isn't some illiterate, blinkered ideology like communism, or a moral grotesquerie like fascism. It is, instead, greed, rampaging, unrepentant, unalloyed, embodied by the ruling regimes entrenched in the pursuit of power and an ever-expanding pocketbook. It's a kleptocratic greed we've already seen take root in Moscow, with Putin and his cronies clinging to power, posing as Russian nationalists in order to siphon off billions for themselves. It's a kleptocratic greed we've seen spread through Beijing, where the officials and the family members connected to the ruling Chinese Communist Party have transformed themselves into little more than a gluttonous regime dedicated to pillaging the Chinese people and leading to a genocide against minority ethnicities like Uyghurs along the way. It's a kleptocratic greed we've seen subsume regimes in Caracas and Tehran and Pyongyang. It's a kleptocratic greed we've seen wherever a democracy has tilted into illiberal authoritarianism or where dictatorships already rule. It's a kleptocratic greed, unmitigated and unceasing, that now presents the greatest threat to the U.S. and its democratic allies. As journalist Oliver Bullough once wrote, kleptocracy is for the 21st century what fascism and communism were for much of the 20th. And he's right. The only difference, this transnational threat isn't emanating from Moscow or Berlin or Beijing or Rome. It is instead reliant on and sustained by the kleptocratic services the U.S. provides in droves, which outpace even those provided by the traditional offshore havens of yore, and which offer the keys to this kleptocratic kingdom to whoever comes knocking, even to those who'd prefer to knock down the entire house of liberal democracy itself. Which is why this fight to end offshoring in financial secrecy and modern kleptocracy begins here, at home. It begins in states like Delaware and Nevada, Wyoming and South Dakota, which have all opened their doors to the torrent of dirty money racing in, helping hide and obscure it for anyone around the world. It begins with legislators pushing policies like those crafted by Massaro and the Helsinki Commission. And it begins in the public square with Americans pushing back against the lobbyists for the hedge funds and private equity and real estate industries, all of which have gorged themselves at the table of American anonymity 
offering their laundering services to kleptocrats, destabilizing countries, immiserating populations, devastating ecologies, brutalizing women and children, and threatening democracy on this planet. Whatever differences once existed between offshore and onshore have collapsed, disintegrated by those in the U.S. who transformed the country into the biggest financial secrecy haven of them all. What was once offshore is now here, beached in the middle of America, surrounding all of us, still, for many, too big to see. Hopefully, though, this book has helped illuminate some of the kleptocracy that is all around us, because it's here, in the U.S., that it can end. And it has to, for if it doesn't, it's not only the end of liberal democracy, but also the imposition of a new global feudalism, a kind of Hobbesian capitalism in its most disgusting, most uncut form, where all ends justify all means, and where a new caste of the wealthiest detach from the rest of society, disappearing their riches into the offshore, onshore world, bankrolling anything and everything that suits their needs, all while blocking any efforts at transparency, reform, or regulatory oversight. It's a world whose outline, in America, and in so many other places alongside, we can already detect. But there's still time to prevent that future. Time to implement the policies long overdue, and to restore American leadership in the anti-corruption and counter-kleptocracy space. Time to bring transparency to worlds and entire money-laundering industries that thrive on anonymity. Time for us to finally end this American kleptocracy before this American kleptocracy ends everything else worth saving. Thank you for listening to American Kleptocracy. 